thank you thank you vishal uh, dear all i welcome you all for the webinar on ivf in cows and buffaloes i hope all of you are well under the present covid 19 situation further i welcome the chief guest and the speaker for our webinar today dr pravin malik who is our animal husbandry commissioner for the whole country i also would like to welcome sri sl pokharna who is the president commercial of raymond and also the trustee of jk trust and he always takes a deep interest into all the activities of jk trust i would like to now welcome our international speakers dr charles looney from united states then jen is a jen prayer from us then dr yeda from brazil and dr julia from brazil you can imagine i mean they it's too early for them for the united states it's almost 4:15 4:30 early morning and for the brazil it is around 6 to 6:30 in the early morning but they took all the pains for such early hours to join this webinar i am grateful to all of them now we are very happy to inform you all that we had a overwhelming response received from for this webinar as the registration touched the figure of 1000 out of 1000 participants about 50 are from various other countries and remaining are almost from every state of india from nook and uh, from every corner of the country now without uh, taking without not taking much of the time i request uh, uh, dr pravin malik our animal husbandry commissioner to uh, open this webinar and give his introductory speech but before that let me uh, introduce him to you all of you as i told you he is animal husbandry commissioner of the country he is a veterinary graduate with his doctorate in veterinary microbiology he is a fellow of reputed national academy of veterinary science india previously he also worked as in charge veterinary type culture collection a repository of microbes of animal origin in icr system and director ccs national institute of animal health in the De uh, department of animal husbandry he has more than 25 years of research experience as veterinary microbiologist he had worked on surveillance of disease in free ranging wildlife salmonella salmonella cytotoxins detection of containment of glanders amongst equines surveillance and monitoring of equine infectious anemia and other bacterial diseases like strangles in equines in india san Uh, sensitive and specific diagnostic for glanders and eia using recombinant proteins and salmonella abortic using omp as well as a vaccine candidate against salmonella in equines were developed under his leadership so i request uh, uh, our animal husbandry commissioner to open the webinar and give his introductory speech thank you over to you sir uh thank you dr sham uh good afternoon everybody and i formally welcome all of you uh, all the guests all the audience uh, to this particular important webinar uh we are very happy from the department that uh, dr sham is taking this initiative from jk trust and i would like to uh, basically welcome our special guest today from us dr charles looney and uh, ms uh, jane prayer and two from brazil who are very experts in uh, ivf is dr yeda uh, watanabe and dr julia they are with us uh, the keen interest uh, from the president uh, of raymond's uh, uh, chairman raymond's uh, uh, mr shantilal i welcome you also sir to this particular uh, uh, webinar and uh, showing your interest in our activities uh, maybe not related directly to your field but uh, uh, absolutely a wonderful uh, initiative from this uh, uh, trust see uh, in fact uh, from the government side we are putting lots of efforts but unfortunately because of certain hiccups either in the government functioning or or from adoption from the farmers we need to have people like uh, Uh, uh dr sham or the ngos like jk trust and bio which should play a very important role in adoption of these kind of important technologies which are very very important 
the focus for today is uh, the ivf technology in cows and buffaloes and uh, we have to take this particular technology to the door steps of the farmers in india in fact we have got uh, uh, we are amongst the leaders in number of animals in the production as such but the productivity level is very very low to match this number with production and productivity we need uh, important activities and we have initiated the use of sex sorted semen we have st started the use of ivf technology we have already uh, planned to establish around 30 labs on ivf so that we can start the technology uh, to reach to the farmers uh, so that outreach will be better of these 30 labs which we have planned 14 have already been operational but this operation is mainly restricted right now to the labs and we need to convert this operation of the lab into the results in uh, translated into the results uh, at the farmers door it means we need to establish pregnancies using this technology we need to have the calves and utilization of those calves if we can use the sex sorted semen in ivf technology because we are lacking in the number of uh, uh, productive bulls the at our standards at least we can have uh, there those sex sorted semen technologies can be uh, coupled with this ivf and we can have number of bulls to our standards in a minimum time so that's our aim and once it is approved we can basically translate this into the field directly for production of female animals also so that we can have better animals in the field so uh, basically uh, the pioneers in this field in india uh, from the ngo side uh, ndri is also working but they are more uh, and more or less uh, restricted to their research uh, uh, aspect but taking this technology to the field to the farmers door we appreciate the uh, efforts from gk trust and we really uh, thank you gk trust uh, and dr shyam jawar uh, with a long experience in this just to inform uh, uh, how uh, what uh, dr shyam has informed that uh, they have uh, a specific gill donor cow which basic uh, called gori and probably dr shyam is going to explain this to you uh, this is a, a kind of uh, uh, what do you call uh, one of the those animals where they can produce uh, around 100 ivf pregnancies in one year around one and a half years so it's like a uh, wonderful initiative where we can not only uh, preserve our, conserve our indigenous breeds but increase the productivity of our indigenous breed as a microbiologist as a biotechnologist i understand the intricacies involved in these kind of technologies but at the same time Uh, to listen to the details of this particular technology i would like to uh, uh, request dr shyam to make the technology so usable that it can reach to each and every veterinarian of the uh, country and this should be used the way we are using artificial insemination using frozen semen so if this can reach to that level then only we can say we, we will be utilizing the fruits of this particular technology which is really wonderful thank you dr shyam uh, for giving me this opportunity and would like to request that uh, the seminars you have already conducted in different regional languages in india uh, to inform our uh, foreign uh, guests uh, the uh, we have got a wide uh, geographical linguistic uh, diversity in our country and it's so much that to reach everybody we have to have those regional uh, efforts also put in place and i appreciate and i really thank dr shyam that they have taken this initiative they have taken up uh, this particular uh, uh, aim of uh, popularizing this technology to different regions uh, including the farmers and the veterinarians uh, together in different la regional languages thank you dr sir uh, it's really mm -hmm. wonderful and uh, would like to listen to you and uh, to our experts also from my broad uh, about this technology i may not be available on video because i will be moving out uh, with my minister right now uh, for a very important meeting and uh, i might get back in case i i get free early uh, and in the meantime i'll try to 
keep myself on on my mobile uh, thank you sir thank you dr sir and uh, welcome again to our experts and, and the jmn ravens thank you dr sir thank you very much sir for such an excellent opening speech for this webinar now let me brief you all about further flow of this webinar to start with i will have my introductory speech and which will be followed by my presentation then i'll be requesting dr charles uh, to make his presentation followed by dr yeda and then uh, mr jain and then followed by dr julia so this will be the flow of the presentation and then it will be followed by question and answers and the closing remarks again uh, we were planning to have our animal husbandry commissioner i'm sure he will try to be back by the time so he can close the webinar so depending on his uh, commitment now we will decide it and then vote of thanks by me so uh, let me uh, start with my introductory speech uh, to utilize the lockdown period due to the covid 19 in a effective way we thought of uh, doing this webinar on the application of ivf technology in cows and buffaloes at the doorstep of the farmer you know that was a specific topic earlier so we did the same in english and then we wanted to reach to the farmers across the country so thought of doing it in regional languages and during the last two months almost on every sunday we organize these webinars in various regional languages such as marathi malayalam telugu gujarati tamil kannada and hindi tomorrow we have a seminar a webinar in punjabi and then the complete uh, uh, to we, we will be completing the rest of the regional languages uh, very by the end of by the by 15th of august and now those who are interested in seeing the regional languages webinar they can go to our youtube links and see even today's uh, recording will be there on our youtube tomorrow will be so now i mean coming back to the today's webinar we thought of doing it exclusively for the veterinarians academicians technicians and other professionals interested in this field so out of the total participants of 1000 we as i told you almost 50% of them are veterinarians now i think i need to do introduction of myself let me introduce myself as i told you i am dr sham zawar ceo jk trust bombay and chief scientist of the jk boa genics did my graduation in veterinary science in the year 1972 and from bombay veterinary college and did i masters in animal reproduction in the year 1974 then in the year 1975 i joined raymond jk trust during the tenure of service i did my phd in the year 1989 which was declared as the first phd in the country on embryo transfer in sheep goat and cattle and then while in the job i did while in the job and working for the last 45 years and i am still working with raymond uh, i uh, i did my uh, senior management programs from i am calcutta london business school and harvard business school and the subject of embryo transfer and ivf as you all know is very close to my heart the application of this technology will rapidly increase the genetically high milk yielding animals in a short span of time that's what we want for our country and you all will come to know about the same after you hear the lectures from our esteemed uh, guest speakers before i close my introductory talk and move to my presentation i would like to inform you all that achievements made in the field of ivf technology by our organization is due to the strong committed ivf team i am having it i am proud of my team members who are dr vinod patil dr amol sahare dr kailash kadam dr sanjeev kumar dr sanjeev dagdu mr ramakan sahu dr ram anbule and mr akash choudhury you can see a question and answer icon at the bottom of your screen so if you have any questions during the session you can type the same and at the end of the session we will try to answer all the questions and if there are specific questions for any particular specific speaker please let us know and we will uh, request them to answer your questions because don't miss this golden opportunity to hear uh, these experts who have taken all the pains to get up so early in the morning and uh, educate all of us further i would like to put on record 
the cooperation extended by veterinary practitioner welfare association of maharashtra for informing about this webinar to the veterinarians of maharashtra i especially thank the president of this association dr manohar akole and his other team members so now i will be starting with my presentation so give me a minute to share my uh, screen on the presentation side Rajan, it is in PowerPoint mode now. Yes, sir. It's a visible. Yes. Thank you. So, everyone knows about the topic uh, which we are talking about: IVF in cows and buffaloes. The presentation outline covers, I mean, in short, about the JK Trust and what are the different means of genetic improvement. A little bit about history of IVF, the definitions and terminology. We'll be using it. I'll be talking about the equipments and the various. steps involved into the ivf what are the different steps like in ivm ivf and these steps how do we use hex semen and what are the concept of the mobile et lab ivf lab which we are having it and then subsequently we talk about our achievements so this will be sort of a my presentation outline let me tell you something about jk trust we have a dynamic leadership our chairman is sri gautam hari singhania who is the chairman of raymond limited and also he is the chairman of uh, jk trust and as i told you we are extremely happy with the presence of our trustee of the jk trust mr sl pokhana he is with us the main focus of our trust activities is livelihood generation through in through interventions in the field of animal husbandry and the objective is to start working on the reducing malnutrition creating employment and poverty elevation we are implementing the cattle and buffalo improvement program as on today through around 2500 centers in 98 districts of the 10 states of the country and benefiting about 2.5 million households in 25000 villages about 5 million upgraded and crossbred cows have been produced since we launched the program from jk trust now i must tell you about our journey for the last 5 decades now we started with a sheep breeding farm in 1970 and then we had a raymond cattle embryo research center in chatisgarh in 1983 in 1997 we launched the jk trust and in 2016 we had this ivf laboratory near pune and in 2016 we also launched the mobile ivf labs uh, so a different concept on its own for a country like india a jk bova genics was coined as a part of the jk trust in the year 2016 to provide the ivf et services at the doorstep of the farmer for faster multiplication of the genetically superior cattle let me tell you we started with the indigenous cattle breeds of india and as per the flagship program of the government of india which is known as rashtriya gokul mission so we worked on those lines right from the year 2016 it was just a sheer coincidence that we took the indigenous animal and that was the flagship program of the government of india now what are the different means of genetic improvement in cattle one is natural breeding as you know it's costly to maintain a bull but that's the one which is commonly used and another choice is artificial insemination and in india we have been doing it for the last almost 60 years it's a very cost effective and but it only taps the male genetic potential and it takes long time to achieve the desired genetic level then came this multiple ovulation and embryo transfer it is definitely costly but the some of the there i mean we have been doing it moet for a long time we jk trust also did for 15 years but we are not doing any more and we are focusing on ivf now because i myself have realized that you know when we are doing moet you are using a complete reproductive tract of the donor cow and then the donors need to be in good reproductive health and there are a lot of limitations where are such limitations are not there in ivf it's one of the most advanced breeding technique no doubt it's expensive but in you get a good results out of it we tap both the male and female genetics to its fullest potential and 
you we are only utilizing the ovary so we are not touching any of the reproductive tract so peak history of the ivf as you know in 1981 the first ivf calf was born at university of pennsylvania and subsequently in 86 the ivf lab protocol was developed at the university of wisconsin again and in 1988 this transvaginal ultrasound oocyte recovery which we are going to talk now was developed at the university of utrecht Uh, in 1988 so what are the uses of ivf in cattle let me uh, brief you some important uses you know the animal which having a dysfunctional reproductive anatomy can be used for doing the ivf those animals not responding to gonadotrophin females that stimulate but don't fertilize sick or injured females eng efforts prepubertal efforts repeat oocyte collections to increase the embryos you are harvesting an extra ova from the pregnant females that's beauty which we can't do it in moit we can do it till 90 days of the pregnancy fertility evaluation on infertile female more utilization of a very expensive semen sex sorted semen which is very expensive can be also used for the ivf very successfully over my presentation now with a few slides you will be listening some of the terms which i'll be using it and i want to quickly run down on them in vitro as you know is a latin word for glass so the event which takes place in the laboratory oocytes are the unfertilized egg or ovum which we are taking out from the follicle ovulation i think i think many of you will know about it ovum is a latin for egg recipient is a female that will receive the embryo and a donor is a female from which we take out the oocytes or embryos are recovered capacitation is a process by which the sperms become capable of fertilizing ovum embryo is a fertilized egg and follicle is the one which holds the ovum so opu is ovum pickup or ultrasounded guided aspiration which we are going to which we use it ivm are these are the different steps now ivm is the in vitro maturation ivf in vitro fertilization ivf in vitro culture and ultimately these all steps will lead to in vitro production of embryos so we call it as ivp now these are our facilities uh, and uh, they are uh, they are a very good international standard i can say or uh, they are based near pune about 70 km away from pune known as a place known as wadgaon this is our laboratory at a glance you can see they are absolutely uh, with the, all the latest equipments and these are the inverted microscope embryo freezing machine and so these are the bench top incubators which are connected with a tri gas which has got a 5% of the carbon dioxide 5% of the oxygen and 90% of the nitrogen in it these are the bench top incubators which are used for culturing the embryos for 6 days and they are mainly used in human beings in a very big way this is a pass box between our oocyte collection shed and the laboratory so that we don't bring any sort of infections into the lab and uh, we have jen she will be talking a lot about the quality control uh, during her speech you will uh, you will be very happy to hear her now the laminar flow station and the incubator centrifuge machines which are being used these are the different equipments this is the equipment which we need for the aspiration i'll brief you about them see i don't want to touch much on this i we have quality control equipment because jen who is a very specialized into this uh field and this is one of her she is very particular on this at this ivf control equipment like using how do you use osmometer and room temperature and how do you maintain ph meters everything so she will talk in detail about that i don't want to touch much on this topic also she will talk about how the log books are being maintained which is a very important part of the whole success story i mean unless and until this is done you you can you never know where you have made a mistake and where do you land and ultimately think as to why our results are poor so let me come straight now as to how the reproductive tract uh, looks like all of you probably know about this this is a genital tract view a front view and then this is a lateral view you can see the ovaries and uh, the cervix and all that now this is a transvaginal oocyte recovery wherein you are putting a ultrasounded guided you transvaginal oocyte recovery is being done through a opu needle holder and you are just touching the ovary 
and then puncturing the follicles through the needle and recovering the oocyte with the suction, with the pressure, using a oocyte recovery media. This is a ovary having a different structure from the ovary at any time, different type of follicles, corpus luteum. So these are the follicular waves, uh, uh, which now at the vista easter cycle divided into metastas, diesters. So you will have follicles continuously with different waves coming in. So that's why this OPU can be done. Even uh, there are literature that you can do once in a week or some literature is there that you can even do twice a week. And we have done many of the aspirations on a, at least on a weekly basis as well. The stimulation protocols, see we have no secrets of the lab. We would like to part with all the secrets, whatever we got, and we want people to utilize this and make a success because as our center has been recognized as a training center, we, there is nothing which we want to hide and we would like to share all our experiences which we got it in getting the results. See, these are the different stimulation protocol of the donor wherein we use the SIDAR or we don't use the SIDAR. You know, that's controlled internal drug releasing device which we use it, which releases the progesterone slowly. And so this is the detailed protocol. So let me not go and those, these will be already there in my presentation, it will be covered into these slides. So this is, and what one most important thing I would like to tell, we have been using a costing period of about 42, 48 to 52 hours, and that's where we are getting very good results. You know, costing period is from the last injection of the fault drop in until you do the OPU. And this is the relationship you can see between the follicles diameter, you know, uh, 20 hours and 92 hours, you, you will not get a very good blastosis rate. Whereas you get a very good blastosis rate from the oocytes recovered if you are doing it between 44 to 68 hours. And that's what our observation is also. Now, this is the donor stimulation protocol for the buffaloes, almost about the same. And uh, this, this protocol, which we are using it. So this is the protocol for the recipient cows. We started with different protocols but uh, we found one of the best protocol now is that when we are using SIDAR with the estradiol benzoate, and then we remove the SIDAR on eighth day, and then we give a shot of uh, polygon, 400 international units, give a shot of ispumate, and then the uh, or lutalase. And also we have been using estradiol CP on it with the heifer 1 ml and the cow is about, uh, uh, with the heifer is about, 0.5 ml and with the cows 1 ml. And you can expect the heat on 10th day and do the embryo transfer on 18th day. We are getting very good results with this. For the buffalo protocol, which we uh, got it from uh, the lab of Julia, she will be talking on exclusively on IVF in buffaloes. We, we could bring uh, some of the very good uh, tips from our lab when we visited Brazil during the last August. So these are the equipments which are used for the aspiration. This is a suction pump, you know, I'm sorry, this is a hot, uh, hot, bar, hot air bath where you keep the tubes of the media at 38.5 degrees centigrade. And this is a suction pump, Cook's suction pump. This is a nice uh, ultrasound, portable one. This is the needle holder in which this needle is being put. And you can use the short needle, which we use it. This is a short needle. Majority of these equipments are manufactured by a company known as WTA in Brazil. And that's really, they, they have some very good products of WTA, our majority products are from WTA. Now this is a, again, a tube, 50 ml tube, in which uh, it is kept warm at 38 degrees centigrade because the, so the oocytes always like the warm. I mean, uh, it could be uncomfortable for us, but we have to make these oocytes are comfortable to get the good results out of it. And this is a suction pump, which is attached to it. Now this is the preparation that pro, one of my colleague, Dr. Kadam is doing it is putting the probe cover on this needle holder, and then this needle is inserted. You can see a small needle here. Again, these needles are, all these equipments are from WTA. Now, the OPU aspiration, I mean, this is the, my another colleague, Dr. Patil. So the, you can see single-handed, this whole thing is completely connected. We have an OPU needle holder, and he will be, he's looking at the ultrasound machine, and then trying to, uh, he, will, he will look at the, locate the follicles on the ovary, holding the whole ovary in his hand. And with the help of this uh, guide, he punctures those follicles. And with a suction through this tube, 
the recovery media comes into this 50 ml tube which is kept into this warmer now this is the interesting animal i think uh, our our expert from abroad will be uh, happy to see this is a, a pungnur animal is only 3 feet height and you can't do even standing so the these numbers are very limited in the country and only way to save them i to increase the number is to that uh, do this ivf so we have to do it sitting these are in some part of andhra pradesh known as a pungnur breed only the height of this animal is 3 feet and gives about 2 to 3 liters of milk so now here is a you can see a a video a small video you can see the follicles and the needle coming it from the top this is a ecogenic needle which i just now showed it so this black follicle the once the ovum is being picked up it it is collapsed and the, this ovum comes through that uh, tubing through the suction it is coming into that 50 ml conical tube so you can see this ovary loaded with the uh, follicles this picture normally you will see with the boss indicus breeds uh, like our indigenous breeds and not with the boss forest breeds which definitely need the uh, stimulation but body boss indicus they will give you the results like this even without stimulation so number sometime we have gone to 60 ewu sites 80 ewu sites and now you you will hear from dr eda even in brazil they have they are how many ewu sites they could have they normally get it from one cow so these are the you know this is the follicle where from this follicular fluid in which the ovum is there is aspirated through the suction now what are the factors affecting this ultrasound guided opu the cattle age and breed how frequently you are doing it how good is the operator what is the needle gauge and then what is the aspiration vacuum we have and what are you doing any gonadotropin treatment now once these tube in which these oocytes are being collected very nice on this 50 ml again a very nice mini ivf filter is designed by wta i we i really started liking this filter very reasonable cheap and then once use it throw it it's almost i think costing a dollar or so and then this whatever fluid which we are collecting it we are passing through this filter and cleaning these who sites with the who with the who with the recovery media and then subsequently we start all the steps into the laboratory as you all know i mean now it's nothing but the we are we are we are going to have a artificial uterus in the laboratory in which we will be developing these embryos over next 7 days and then putting back into the recipients so in vitro maturation these from who sites are taken out from this 50 ml tube they are poured into a, a into a mini tube a mini filter as i told you then they are cleaned with the washing media and then they are subsequently put into a four well dish having the in vitro maturation media and these are again then put into the bt37 incubator which i showed some time back now all the media let me tell you which we are using uh, belongs to a, a well known company in brazil vitrogen and uh, they are the, they are the pioneers who started the iv of work in brazil well long back we are fortunate to have dr eda with us and she is the managing director and the uh, the chief scientist of that uh, vitrogen lab so we are getting all our media from that lab see once we see the who sites we have to classify them a b c d uh, the more with the cumulus cells they are the a b c and you don't get normally any embryos developing out of d and e so you need to do this uh, classification and then after 22 to 24 hours when you take out these oocytes from this bench top incubator this is how they look like before maturation when we have collected it and post maturation they will be the sloughiness you can see the cumulus cells are getting loosened around the two sides and that's how it looks like and there now the procedure of the ivf has to start these are the micro q incubators maintained at 38.5 degree centigrade wherein they are very handy in if you are going to the field and bringing it from the farmer's doorstep you can bring those two sides into those incubator and we carry as a hand baggage without any air ticket in the aircraft nobody asks so they are the our passengers traveling without without paying any ticket for them now semen characterization again here also i don't want to get into more details because we will have an expert talk from uh, uh, jen about how the semen evaluation is how critical and important it is 
So she will go into more details. So I will skip some of these slides. She will really uh, cover into extensive detail as to how important it is to evaluate the semen in detail and how do we prepare the semen for the IVF. These uh, pre-labeled, uh, she will explain all the stuff, but the, all the semen which we have prepared it, it's need to be finally checked it for the quality and then we decide as to what is the quantity of the semen you need to use it for doing the IVF. These are the different, uh, the, you know, we use the percol gradient for making the pre-centrifuge layered semen and then we centrifuge and then we wash. And this is the ultimately pellet from which uh, we uh, calculate it with the use of hemocytometer. And then we decide as to how much sperms we have to put for the IVF, which Jane will cover into more detail. Now, these are the preparation of the mature oocytes for our, our lab into the IVF lab. Here is a, my another colleague, Dr. Amol Sare, who is doing this uh, preparation and he is my, he is the laboratory in charge with us. So IVF, now again, here also we have to use, as I told you, for IVM, we have been using, again, vitrogen media. This is IVF media, which is a exclusively media, again, with 70 microliter of IV of medium, we have to add mineral oil to that. And in each well of the noob four well dish, then you have to prepare it well in advance from the equilibration point of view, at least one day before. And then the total volume is created like this with the 5 ml and 10 ml with IV of media and with the helicots which we get from them, helicot H and helicot PHE. So once this is done, we take about three droplets of 100 microliter of IV of media into 16 to 15 mm dishes. And after 22 hours of maturation, which we have seen it, the oocytes are washed into three drops of this media. And we have to ensure all this process is completed, IVF procedure within 24 hours from the start of the maturation of the oocytes. So we start it at 22 hours and knock it out by 20, 24 hours. You can see a small, a quick video as to every sperm wants to get into the oocyte and their oocytes are literally encircled with these sperms and they are, everybody is trying for an entry and one, once one sperm goes, then there is a no entry. I'm using the frozen semen, uh, uh, sex semen has got a tremendous advantages. You allow the low concentration and 90% confidence of the desired gender and one unit of semen can be distributed among um, more than one donor. Sex semen definitely have a challenges in using in IVF. Lower semen concentration and sex semen has a lower time in in vitro for survival. Embryo production for sex semen is lower as compared to the conventional semen. And uh, this is a, again just as how the sex semen sexing is done. I don't want to get into the more details of it. But let me tell you, it's a very interesting slide. This is in vivo. If you have a one donor, you know, you know one unit of straw, we'll have about 2 million of the sex sperms. And in one donor, if you have to use it in vivo, you use two to three straws and you land with zero to five embryos. Whereas if you do same thing in vitro, you will have about one to five donors you can use that one straw with one unit and you will have a oocyte average, if it is from 12 to 100, you land with the embryos with 25% development and they will range from three to 25. So that's the difference using the sex semen in, in vivo and in vitro. Uh, these are the oocyte uh, diagram of meiosis. Uh, I will skip that. Now, this is the next step is in vitro culture, wherein you have to culture these uh, embryo, uh, culture these potential zygotes, uh, which we call as a presumptive zygotes also for about six days. And they are also put into the IVC media, and then which is also put into the benchtop incubator. Again, they are equilibrated beforehand. And after 20 hours of IVF, what we do, after 20 hours, we take out this potential zygote and then they need to be clean, you know? Uh, so sometimes uh, they need to, the tumular cells around them need to be clean. So we use a stripper having a pipette tip diameter of 150 micron. And after washing them, and then these potential zygotes are kept uh, into the IVC medium for the next six days in benchtop incubator at 38.5 degrees centigrade. Fourth day after IVF, it is 
uh, always better to see as to how the cleavage is, which we do it and which we record it. Now, this is how these potential or presumptive zygotes will look like on third day uh, once you clean the uh, cumulus cells around it. But nowadays, we do leave some cumulus cells around it. So this is a culture in BT 37. For six days, we do it. But these are the embryo development stages from one cell to two cell, four cell, eight cell, and 16 early morula. But these are 6.7 to 7.5 day IVF embryos, a beautiful expanded blastocyst. We always prefer to have the expanded blastocyst for our IVF work to, to do the transfer. This is a bunch of embryos which we have produced at our facility. You may like to see, I will take an additional one minute, but this is an interesting video, video not related to our uh, cattle work, but it's a human, you know, time lapse human embryo video. You can see they're all labeled. And it's an actual one. Uh, it's not. It's a live. How the embryos are being developing it. You can see you know, how they will come out of the zona pellucida, and you can see the time lapse. You can. This I think 2008, and every second the watch is being clicked here, and you can see how these human embryos are developing it and how they are coming. How they will come out. So every you can see there how the cell number is growing it, and then uh, they will come out of the. Uh, they will come out of the zona pellucida. So you can see in six days, five, four to five days, the whole uh, thing. I'll just wait for another few seconds and I'll move to the next slide. So, uh, sorry, I mean, that's what, uh, okay. Now to summarize it very quickly, as we have seen a donor cow, where we do ovum pickup and then we do in vitro maturation, fertilization, embryo culture, and these embryos are developed and you transfer them in recipients. If you have extra embryos, you freeze them. We have two different methods of freezing, slow freezing and vitrification. We have been following both. And let me tell you something very good about this incubator. It's a lab mix incubator, again developed by WTA. We found it's very good one because it has got a tri-gas supply. So when we are using this other uh, micro -Q incubator, and if you have to transport the oocytes, there you have to use the HIPS media. But here in case of this, we don't need the HIPS media. We can use a regular IBM media. You can transport the oocytes, or you can transport the embryos also. And you can even take the embryos on sixth day. And if you have to travel for 24 hours, it's OK, because the gas supply is there, and there is a temperature at 38.5 degrees centigrade. So the embryos are developing it into the incubator. There's a mini incubator, which you can carry it along with you as a hand baggage. I'm very happy with this. And we have got about two incubators of them and we, we are looking for adding some more into that. So this is our IVF mobile uh, lab, which is there. I will talk about you afterwards. Uh, this is uh, where the embryo transfer is done at a field level. I myself, I'm doing this ET over there. Now, see, this is the fleet of vans we have got. This is a big van we started with initially, but then we realized it that we don't need such a big van. So we have got this small, nice ambulance model vans are there, where in every equipment, of the IVF is fitted and only the embryologist can get into it and no second person has got a scope to get into this van also. Now, quickly to de uh, define as to what is the in vivo and in intro embryo production. In MOET, you know, multiple ovulation are there, but we need a normal stimulation. We have to do AI at heat and do the embryo forcing on six for seventh day, wherein we use the complete reproductive tract. As against in OM pickup, we are doing aspiration of the ovaries, the ovum pickup, and with or without stimulation, as I told you, it could be done in pre pivotal if for pregnant animals. So a lot of advantage OGS were there. Now, uh, the second part of my presentation, let me see what breeds we have been working at our Vodagaon farm. These are the different indigenous boss indicus breeds we are working. These are the exotic breeds which we are working, and off late we started some work on buffaloes as well. So these are our elite donors. This is the gear uh, donors. These are the Saival breed donors. These are, you know, these are jerseys. Uh, they're all born out of the imported embryos. They were imported from United States. And now they are going to be my future donors for production of the jersey embryos. Similarly, this is from Semex Canada. We have HF9, uh, which we are developing it. We imported some embryos and they will be our future donors. Now let's come to the achievements of the JK Trust. We produce India's first IVF male calm calf, known as, named as a Krishna, and India's first IVF female calf, 
from frozen IVF embryo at our Gopalnagar facility. This calf was named as a Krishna because I had some selfish interest in this because my name is Sham, so we named it as a Krishna. Provided we are providing IVF services at 37 farms across various states in India. We have 14 calves produced from a gear donor cow in a year's time, but uh, and we named it as a Radha. And but subsequently, the another cow which Animal Husbandry Commissioner was referring. We have a one more cow known as Gauri, uh, she, and we got 92 IVF pregnancies from that cow uh, in a short span of 14 months by repeated aspirations. We already got 36 cows born out of it, and we have been using a very good uh, semen of a bull known as Soberono from uh, Brazil. Another project which we did is that we produced 520 Angol, what we call Nerori in Brazil, IVF embryos, and Pungnur embryos also. And so to summarize it, we have produced about 4,000 IVF embryos in the country, established about 446 IVF pregnancies. Half of these pregnancies are at the doorstep of the farmer. These figures look very small in front of the figures of United States and Brazil. But my, I, in, in, I would like to brief to my guest speakers that for the country like India, wherein this was the only work which started by JK Trust, and we have lightened the lamp of the IVF in the country. And now there should be many, many organizations like us to take us to take these things further and benefit the maximum farmers of the country. 2016 onward data I have put in, we have done about 1,615 aspiration. But you can see the, the was, what is most important in a boiling thing is that what sort of a blastosis rate you get it. We have started with 17%, 20, 20, 24, and now we are touching almost 30%. And we will like to touch it at least 40% blastosis rate. And we should get about 40% pregnancy rate. And I'm sure we'll be able to achieve, with, achieve those targets. A quick seasonal effect we have seen that in case of winter, we found the blastosis rate are 34, 34% are better than the summer and the monsoon. Some people are under the impression that you aspirate the cow so many times whether they will get pregnant. No, there's no problem. As long as your technology is correct. See, we have these four cows, gear cows, they've been aspirated so many times, 17, 18, 23 times in a short span of one year. And in one insemination, they have been made pregnant. That is the beauty. And then still you can, I mean, aspirate them for another three months of pregnancy. I will not go into the details of individual state because our country is such a vast country, but we have got about, now we are operating in almost in eight states and these are the farmers we are benefiting, and these are the calves which are born out of our work. Now, most important thing, to get the confidence of the farmer, we started using this IVF van, and all the process is being done into the IVF van, which is parked below a tree here, almost for nine days, and we collect the oocytes and produce the embryos and transfer in the farmer's recipients, and that's how the farmers will get a confidence. And he will, uh, he, see, you can see the whole thing right at the, village level condition which we are doing it. These are some of our calves born in the Maharashtra state in Gujarat. This is a concrete breed in Brazil. Uh, they, they call it the Gujeral. And these are the gear calves which have been born to them. So this is a beautiful identical twins which is, which is produced out of one single embryo, IVF embryo which has happened. These are the calves in another state. Here I think sometime back somebody was talking about using the infertile donors. You know, these are the HF donors, let me tell you, these are the three champion donors which were not able to breed for two years. And we aspirated them, we produced embryos, and we could produce cows out of them. So this is the good part of it that you can use such donors also, which are not getting pregnant, and produce the IVF cows out of it. Some of the other achievements are, again, this is a Tharparkar cow with the three calves. I have already told you about that. This is my cow, Radha, with the 14 calves around her. And this is the Gauri, which I always feel very happy, having 92 pregnancies and we should be touching century very soon. And we have got 36 calves born out of it. These are the embryos. She, whenever she comes, now I think this is a variation thing, which Eda will cover in more detail, you know, donor to donor variation, breed to breed variation, variation due to the sire, all these things, they play a very, very important role into the IVF. And Yeda is going to talk specifically, specifically on these. Like as I told, Jen will be talking on semen evaluation and the quality control. And 
Dr. Charles. He will be talking about overview of the whole ET uh, IVF because he has uh, Jane and Charles and Yeda. They have put their whole life into this, and they are the they are the well-known uh, leaders in the world. Uh, and Charles will be talking about the scenario in the United States or also in the world as to how where this IVF industry is moving around, moving ahead. And these are some of the Gauri calves, female and male calves born at our farm. Uh, everybody wants to get uh, one or two Gauri calves. There's so so much of in a demand for them. Uh, now IVF in buffaloes again. We have a Julia, she's going to talk in detail, but let me tell you, we could, when we visited August last to her, to her facility, we were very impressed and we would discuss with her and uh, Nelcio, her husband, and we got some tips from there. And honestly, with that, we just took one trial and with one hit, first hit only, we got eight pregnancies, 20% pregnancy rate. We couldn't do much work on the further in buffaloes, but country like India, they need to really do a lot of buffalo work, and I'm sure we'll be able to do it uh, once I add on some more people in my team. We would like to take up the work on the buffaloes as well. No doubt there are some limitations in buffalo, which uh, Julia will cover into extensive depth. But, uh, you know, we did this immediately after coming. We were in August in Brazil, and soon after coming, we did this work in September 2019, and we got uh, this Evaluations were done in October 19, and we are 44 IVF embryos, 43 were transferred in eight pregnancies. We got around 20% pregnancy rate, and they are going to calf in August again. Just same time, again, the Brazilian uh, ET conference will be there, but this time, I think, it is an online conference. So in 12 months uh, since we came from Brazil, we could achieve this milestone, and again, we'll be credited, Jacobus will be credited to have the first uh, IVF cows or buffaloes also in the country. Now, these are the one which I was talking about. These are the three owners, a very good buffalo farm near Pune, where we have these pregnancies. But the one interesting thing, out of the eight pregnancies, this one single buffalo, and we had a, you know, two hatching blastosis and five expanded blastosis uh, developed out of this, and we could get three pregnancies out of this from one single buffalo. So if this sort of results we can go on getting into buffaloes, it will really, uh, it will be a wonderful thing. No doubt these are again variation which uh, Yeda will be talking about. There is so much of variation. Now, I'm on the last two slides of my uh, presentation. We had a secretary, Animal Husbandry Government of India, who is the topmost authority in the government uh, uh, sitting at Delhi, who visited our lab with uh, all, the, all the senior member of the team. And, uh, uh, you know, he visited on just before the lockdown, he was. this is our internal pictures of the lab, he was very impressed with our whole work. And uh, subsequently, this, these our facilities are recognized now by the Department of Animal Husbandry, Government of India, to impart the training in IVF as just now, sometime back, the Animal Husbandry Commissioner also told. Our biggest challenge in the country in IVF, which uh, Animal Husbandry Commissioner rightly pointed out, was that to bring down the cost and our Honorable Minister for Animal Husbandry, he's also very, very keen on this IVF technology. The only constraint coming is that today it is costing around 25 to 30,000 rupees of pregnancy. If that can be brought down to 10 to 15,000 rupees per pregnancy, really it can really create a great difference. And I think I'm sure with more and more work and uh, if you can bring down the custom duties and some of the factors, and improve, go on improving the results, uh, then I think it, that should also be possible. The days are not very far away from them, but, uh, and as, I, as they were told, there are about 30 ET IVF labs in the country which are being funded by the government of India, and uh, we should be getting the people from that institute for the training. And our training will be also not like just doing the training, but we will see that they are trained and when they go back to the labs, they will produce the calves, the way in which we had the training. We have, I must tell you, we have a, two of our teachers into this uh, 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 webinar, uh, Dr. Charles and Jane. I have been, you know, let me tell you two lines about them. I had my training with them in 1985, which is 35 years back when I learned how to do in vivo embryo transfer from them. 
and look at the coincidence of the life back again in 2016 after 30 years exactly we went for our ivf training to the both of them only uh, i mean i mean so many people around the world in united states but it was just a sheer coincidence or whatever our luck we i went back to my same teachers where i had my training 35 years back so i have a great uh, regards for them and uh, they took all the pains and as i told you uh, getting up so early in the morning and uh, wanted to share their experiences and same way Eda and uh, uh, Julia as well. Now I'm concluding my presentation. Uh, again, let me tell you, uh, this is the team I already talked. Dr. Vinod Patil, Dr. Amul Sahare, Dr. Kailash, Dr. Sanjay, Sanjeev Kumar, Ramakan Sahu and Akar Chaudhary. Now I will just take another two minutes. I mean, I want to show to our international guest. See, this is our mobile IVF van, a small video, which is a small ambulatory van in which you can see every equipment what you need right from uh, production right from the oocyte aspiration so everything is fitted there co2 incubator benchtop incubator you can see embryo freezing machine in such a small uh, van wherein there is no scope for a second person to go so this sort of a mobile ivf van is a need of the country and this is what i am recommending telling to the animal husbandry officials at in uh, central government that they should have a, a IVF mobile lab at a district level, every district level, have two trained people, one aspirator and one embryologist moving along with this van all across the country, tapping the elite cows and buffaloes and do this uh, work on a large scale, mass scale, and having all complete quality control, which is the most important part. So this way only we can uh, spread the technology. We don't need a very high-tech laboratory, uh, very expensive laboratory to establish it in a, such a small van, you can fit in everything and do the work. And I'm really grateful to you and thankful to all of you for uh, listening my, me uh, for such a long time. And thanks a lot. Now, uh, uh, the next one, I would like to uh, request, uh, I will now request our guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Charles Looney, to speak, but uh, let me let me introduce him. Rajan, uh, can you put Dr. Charles on the? Rajan, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Put, put, uh, one second. Huh? Okay, thank you. I can see Charles now. I wanted to see him and then talk. So Charles, uh, Charles is a bachelor's and master's degree in the from the University of Arkansas. Doctorate in animal science, reproductive and reproduction from Louisiana University. And uh, you know, Charles worked with the Grenada Bioscience for 10 years as a senior scientist. And that's where I was, uh, had my training in Grenada. While at Grenada, he worked in ET production and was a member of team that produced the first embryo cloned cattle and recombinant BFSH, LH. After Grenada, he consulted with several groups for a year before taking a position in 1992 with a transova genetics. And in 1999, he started a new company, Ova Genics at Bryan, Texas, an eight year certified embryo transfer company. And he has spent the last 40 years traveling and promoting our industry, both in the United States and around the world. See, I hope, I don't know how many people, how many of you might have caught this, Ova Genics. And you know our trust name, our, our organization name, JK Bova Genics. So, you know, I just added JKB behind that. And Jen, who is here, she was the one who helped me in coining this word. So that is how JK Bova Genics was born. So currently, Charles is in a new role as a beef cattle improvement specialist for the state of Arkansas, working closely with the Extension Service and University of Arkansas. He is a professor, Department of Animal Science at University of Arkansas. He is a member of International Embryo Transfer Society since 1978 and a member of American Embryo Transfer Association since its formation. He has spoken and worked in over 15 countries and setting up the programs in Australia, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, Mexico and France. Dr. Charles has been the most successful in application of reproductive technology to benefit cattle producers his research interests 
are super ovulation, easter synchronization, site cryobiology, and embryo manipulation. In short, I can say it is an encyclopedia of the embryo, IVF, reproductive biology. You tell anything and you will have an answer for that. Over to Charles. Thank you very much. I pass on to Charles now. Thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, it's great to uh, join the webinar. We've, uh, I have to say, we truly enjoyed having Sean and his team with us in Texas for about two months. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of uh, good times and, and learning and teaching, and he taught us quite a lot. And then our trips to uh, India has been, been well received. We got a chance to, to uh, see some of the parts of India. I was just telling them I, I enjoyed India a lot, except for the driving. The driving there is just unbelievable, particularly in Mumbai. And it's just, it's, it's really uh, interesting. So, but, you know, he asked me to, uh, to talk a little bit about the overview of the industry, particularly here in the United States. But I thought I would start out just kind of telling you a little bit about the history of how we began the, uh, the work. And I've been lucky enough to work with uh, several companies that are on the cutting edge of trying to develop some of these technologies, particularly at Granada. When I graduated from LSU, I got a chance to, to uh, work with Granada and a tremendous amount of, of great scientists and, and, and managers and administrators. It was a great pleasure to work there every day, trying to uh, keep up with what's going on. So, and probably in the late 80s, uh, we were involved in a lot of in vivo work, particularly with transgenics and cloning. And uh, we had got a chance to uh, hire Frank Barnes from uh, Wisconsin, and they with Mark Rard and Neil first doing a lot of in vitro fertilization type work, in vitro maturing of the oocytes. Uh, those kind of processes were, were taken off. And, and then in 86, John Parrish produced some of the first uh, programs for commercial in vitro fertilization with his work with heparin. And in, in 86, that paper was probably the most Refer reference paper in in the world, particularly in IVF, and today, we we basically are able to uh, to utilize many thousands and millions of dollars of research in in vitro fertilization, particularly in the International Embryo Transfer Society and the Brazilian Transfer Society. Without those two societies pushing the technology, we wouldn't be where we're at today. But in the uh, in '86, we started doing a lot of re research with in vitro fertilization. Uh, after after John produced his paper, uh, we also got a chance to uh, go to Europe and watch Martin Patrice, who was working in Steph Dillman's lab at Utrecht University, aspirating cows with the mechanical sector ultrasound. Obviously, in the uh, IVF world, in in the in the human field, had much more advanced than what we had in in the, in the cow business. Our cow business always lagged behind, uh, just according to where we work with uh, with superovulation and multiple embryo transfer. Uh, we did a lot of work with that. The human field doing a lot of in vitro fertilization. I think. Uh, uh, Edwards produced that first uh, IVF baby something like 48 years uh, ago. So it's been, uh, it's been a wild rocket ship ride with I IVF. But working uh, with Chuck Bolin and with the uh, Aloka 500 made in Japan, that ultrasound machine uh, re def definitely revolutionized our uh, work in IVF and particularly oocyte retrieval. I went to Europe and watched them aspirate cows over there. They're using these large mechanical sectors. It took two people to uh, do the work. One, one person had their hand in the rectum. The other person worked a needle. And there was no way in the United States we developed that technology. So we 
we had our hand in the rectum and also worked the needle at the same time because if somebody's going to stick my finger, I wanted it to be me instead of someone else. So it's one of those kind of things that developed uh, very quickly. Steph Dillman lab was studying OSI recovery and, and maturing. Uh, Frank Barnes's group here uh, in, in Texas, we were developing that technology because we've always worked with in vivo and it was costing us thousands of dollars to uh, produce these, uh, these calves and we had to collect all the oocytes from cows in an in vivo method. So IVF and oocyte maturing, particularly from the slaughterhouse was developing. And, and then also with the uh, aspiration technique. The first aspiration methods that we used uh, in Texas, we didn't really know how to develop it. So we had to actually use a broomstick to measure how deep the vagina was so we could actually build the first handle that we used to aspirate a, a, a cow. So it was a, a truly a, a great opportunity to, to move that, that technology. We, when I was working it with the uh, group in Iowa, we, we developed uh, the use of these technologies of problem cows. Like most reproductive technologies, initially there worked with some of the obscure problem cows. So we took 20 cows that hadn't produced an embryo in two years, enrolled them in an IVF program, and each one of those cows produced a pregnancy in the first 60 days that we started this program. So people that was working with the multiple ovulation embryo transfer methodology realized what power we had with IVF technology. At that time, our results were about 15% of oocytes that were collected produced an embryo compared to today where somewhere around 30 to 40% of those oocytes are produce an embryo. So it's, we've, we've, gone a, we've gone a long way, but still we've, uh, we've improved the technology we don't have the same symptoms of the large calf syndrome. We don't have skewed uh, sex ratios like we did uh, initially. So a lot of things are improved. So just to I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in IVF in, in, in the United States, it's basically taken over the, uh, and, and replaced the multiple embryo transfer te techniques where we actually flush the embryos from bread, from cows that are inseminated and then transfer those embryos. There's some discrepancies in results. It's still a lot more variable than what we would have and our pregnancy rates are still lower. But the cattlemen realize what are the great advantages of IVF offer because we can collect more embryos in a quicker time with more, more, more different sires. We can use sex semen and then therefore at the same time, we can collect oocytes from cows that are gestating their own fetus, which was just tremendous. And we can do it at a lower cost at a faster rate. So cattlemen in wanting to uh, produce their female genetics faster, IVF is, is where they're gonna go to. So the guys at the coffee shops, they talk about how many embryos are produced and you know we can get hundreds of embryos produced from single cows in a short period of time with multiple sires. So it's a great advantage for our, our cattlemen. We wouldn't have this advantage if we didn't have some of the vendors working with us. And in early days, we worked with Cook International, Cook Vet, Vet Products from Australia. Uh, we worked with in vitro um, IV, IVM uh, from France. But who's helped us most is the WTA company from Brazil. If we didn't have those people working with us, we wouldn't be where we're at today. They have been able to, I mean, you can show these people a little bit about what you're looking with and two days later, they'll have it for you. It's amazing. So, I mean, without those people and the research we've done with IETS, SBTE, AETA, those organizations have moved this technology further, further than we've ever seen it. So we're, we're really been blessed with those type of opportunities. 
And it's great to see how much progress is made in India because it's not easy to work in India. There is a lot of roadblocks that you have to go through to get things done, but to see your success has been tremendous. So, I mean, kudos to y'all and we're real, real proud that y'all use us to help you get it started. So we're, we're, we're really, really happy in that regard. So that's basically all I want to say. And uh, I want to, I'm looking forward to listening about the Buffalo. The Buffaloes are the most intriguing animals that I've worked, worked with. And I got a chance to go to uh, South Africa and work with Cape Buffalo. So I'm very uh, interested, maybe using that technology to work with some of these, uh, these species in, in Africa too. So great, enjoyed it a lot. Thank you for your time and uh, looking forward to, to hearing the rest of the talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. I mean, uh, really appreciate uh, for your uh, wonderful uh, speech. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Yeda Fumi Vetinbi. Let me introduce her. Uh, she is a reproductive embryologist and a managing director of Vitrogen Brazil. I was talking about those all Vitrogen media to you. She is a postdoctorate in the area of IVF embryo gene expression, and then she did her degree in biological sciences from the University of Sao Paulo experience in veterinary medicine embryology, focusing on biotechnology applied to animal reproduction and acting on themes related to maturation, fertilization, and in vitro culture, cryopreservation, stem cells, and cloning processes. She was responsible for the birth of first IVF calf in the country, Brazil in 1994 during her doctorate. So we have a lot of Almost all the speakers were there first in something or other. So now she then in 1998, uh, was, uh, then in uh, 1998 she founded Vitrogen, a pioneer in the commercial application of the in vitro fertilization technique in cattle in Brazil. Currently she is a scientific advisor at WTA, Wharton B Applied Technology, who are mainly manufacturing different type of IVF equipments uh, so I request now Dr. Yeda to talk on the, as to what is the different variants uh, which cause uh, on the embryo, in vitro embryo production. Over to Dr. Yeda, uh, if you can share your presentation, uh, share your screen and start with your presentation, please. Yes. Yeah, good. Thank Hello. you. Oh, yeah. oh, thank you for inviting to the to webinar. And in, uh, good evening, good evening, good good afternoon for every everybody. And in Brazil, good morning. And I will talk about the. Oh, sorry. I will talk about about the factors that affect in the IVF embryo production. Okay, and the next. Thing. Uh, when you see the about the like Dr. Shan uh, talk, the commercial bovine ovum pickup application, it's just to increase the embryo production because when you compare the insemination that you have one pregnant a year, the IVF it's possible to produce. Uh, until 50 and 70 uh, pregnancies for per year. It's about the two or three pregnancies for sex on the ovum pickup. Then you can use the sort of the semen uh, and one straw. It's possible to work with five or six, depends of the the quality of the semen. And the Jane, I think that you talk about this too. And uh, it's possible to, to use one straw to five and six donor. And you can choose the beef, more male, or the dairy for female calves. These techniques for the Bos Indicus, 
here in Brazil that work water uh, a lot with Nelore and the uh, Ongol in this case it's a uh, Nelore then it's not necessary to use the hormone to stimulation and you can use it a lot I think in the United States use a lot in the hyper genomics donor this is the steps only to see the the steps the you put the oocyte 24 hours in, in the vitro maturation, in IVM, then preparation the semen, the IVF, in vitro fertilization, and put the zygote to culture in day one until day seven, then you produce the blastocyst. Uh, I will talk, I will presentation to everybody, some variation uh, about the donors and the genetic groups, the breeds, and then you have the variation uh, among the sire, the bull, and the interaction uh, between sire and, and donors. Uh, this is a work that a retrospective study that you you did this this date from the Brazilian commercial lab, the Vitrogen, uh, 16 work, 16 years, the, the dates that Petro Barrucelli and uh, all the, the, the people that work with him uh, publication this, this work. And uh, you compare the Bos Indicus uh, to breed in the Lorian gear and Bostaurus, Senepol, and Hoste, and about the 5,000 beef uh, donors and uh, 1,600 uh, there. Then this is the number of the all the ovum pickup, the Nelore, Senepol, Gear, and Hoste. It's about the 8,000 uh, ovum pickup that produce the ovum pickup with the, about the 100 veterinarians. Then you can see here, this is the distribution of the quantity of the oocyte. This is the quantity of the oocyte in the Nelore and the average is, is about 27 oocyte, viable oocyte okay, in Nelore. This is in Senepol in gear and the quantity and the hosting. Then you can see this is the curve that you, that you have some, some, some donor that produce less oocyte and these that you produce more oocyte. Then we divide it in four uh, part two, in four phase, the quantity of the oocyte. In this case, you can see here the Nelore then the lower quartile, the average, this is the quantity of the animals that produce in the average 90.4 oocyte. And the rate of the, the production of the blastocyst at 45% and produce 2.6 blastocyst for ovum pickup. Then this is the lower quartile and this is the more high quartile that you produce 54, uh, the average of the oocyte and uh, about 13 embryos. And you can see everything in the, uh, all these data for the Senecol, this is the lower and the high and the, qu the quantity of the blastocyst or ovum pickup, 2.6 and 11. This is the another breeding, the gear. And the eight, the variation, the lower eight until uh, almost 50 oocyte for ovum pickup. And the quantity of the, the, the embryos. Then you can, you can see the, the quantity of the oocyte, it's not correlation with the the competence to produce the blastocyst, the rate of the blastocyst. This is the same, you don't have the difference. This is in the Horsten, 
you can see this is 6.7 and this is the and the the high superior uh, quartile is about 29 39 oocytes and it's possible to produce until 8 8 uh, embryo for ovum pickup in hosting too then uh, about the variation, you have this variation. Another factor is the, the bull or the bulls. And the bulls in this case is the 48 in a lot of signs. Bull that you use at least the 15 op OPU session. Then you can see here the, this bull that produces the average 6% of the blastocyst and this bull that produced 10% of the blastocyst. Then it's very important to, to see, to choose the, the best bull to use for the pro, uh, production, the IVF uh, production embryos. This is the work that you, you did in Senegal. Then you can see here uh, 90 bulls. So do you have nine bulls that you use? This is the quantity of the oocyte that you use for each bull. This, this colony is the rate of the blastocyst. It's the average is 35% of the blastocyst and the pregnancy 37% of the pregnancy. Then you can see this bull in this case if you can, you can see here, it's lower uh, rate of the pregnancy compared to another bulls. Then you can, you can see, you can talk the, this bull, it's not so good for the IVF, but it, when you compare this bull, when you do the mating with different donors, you can, you can see in this case, the donor two, when you transfer seven embryos, you have 75% uh, of the pregnancy. And this bull, you have a high pregnancy too, about 43%. Uh, and in this bull, in this donor too, 35% is the average the pregnancy. And the problems here is the this bull F with this donor six that I transfer. Uh, 156 uh, embryo, and you have only 28% of the pregnancy. But this donor, when you see here, with this bull, you transfer 44 embryos, and you have 57% of the pregnancy. Then, you need to choose it when you do the, this study to, to, to information that you, you see the, the best mating. This cow, uh, it's better for the, not the, for the production of the embryos, but the pregnancy rate. Then you can increase a lot your result of the pregnancy rate. Like in this, this is a project that it, uh, Vitrogen did these uh, uh, 18 years ago, okay? Then you, you work two years during three months each phase. In the, the first years, you have 70, uh, 60 donors. Then you produce, this is the quantity of the oocyte, and this is the, the production of the embryo, the rate, 30% of the the production, the blastocyst, and the pregnancy rate is, the first phase is 26% of the pregnancy, you have this. Then the next year, uh, when you have all the dates of the rate of the pregnancy, you study the best mating for this, this donor, it's, it's better to use it for this, this bull to increase the pregnancy. Then you can saw you increase three times the pregnancy rate 
only to study what the best interaction the donor and the donor and child. Here is the, the result is the evolution of the ovum pickup in Brazil from the uh, 20 years ago, 22 years, when you have, uh, you can see here the, the percentage, the rate of the plasticist and the pregnancy. And here is one pregnancy for ovum pickup. And now you have uh, two point uh, four pregnancy for ovum pickup of the average. But if you study the best mating, you can increase this a lot. Now I will talk about the logistic because in Brazil, uh, it's like in India too, and uh, in the United States, it's a big, a big country. Then you need to transport it off the oocyte and the embryo. Then you develop uh, WTA, develop uh, the equipment, the lab mix. This is the incubator that you, you put the oocyte here. In this case, this is a, a mobile incubator that you put the oocyte and then you can, you, you must arrive in, in the lab 24 hours after, after the ovum pickup. And the next day to do the IVF and you have the benchtop incubator. In this kind, the benchtop incubator, different for the human incubator, you have the lead here is more high that you can put the, the vial, the microtube here that you, when you arrive from the, the farm. And you put it for the production the embryo in this incubator and you have the embryo transfer here inside the straws. This is the work that you, you produce the embryos in the Uberaba here and transfer the, the embryos 2,000 kilometers the distance that you have the recipients there. Then you produce the embryos, uh, you do the aspiration the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And another week, you put the, all the embryos in, that you have in day four, five, and six inside this vial in the incubator, which you have the gas, the, the gas with five, five, and ninety percent of the gas, the CO2, the O2 and nitrogen. And you put here and some, some embryos stay inside this incubator for three days more until day seven. Then I put a transfer in the farm and you have, you don't have the, the difference of the pregnancy, the embryos that stay for one day, two or three days in the incubator. This is the pregnancy rate in one month and two months. And you have it only here in this case, the abortion, the one or 2%. Uh, we work here in Brazil uh, in some lab. This is the result of the lab one, two, three, the commercial lab in Brazil that you work with the, this kind of the oxygen in all the step. In this case, you use the IVF to in 20% in, in of the oxygen. And this is the production of the, the pregnancy. So the, re, the result of the pregnancy, it's very good when you produce in all step. And here in one lab, you compare the, the embryos produced in all the step in the lower oxygen, or in this case, when you use the big incubator with 20% of the oxygen, then the quality of the embryos is the same when you saw the rate of pregnancy. Then you can work in human, uh, most of the lab you work in the older step in the lower oxygen. And you have some article that if you produce in the older step with the lower oxygen, you, you can increase the quality of the embryos uh, to cryopreservation. 
This is some result when you work it with a, um, um, a large scale of the production of the embryos. In this case, you work it in the Russian and the port days, and you produce uh, about 3,000 embryos and uh, vitrify all these embryos and the transfer in the in the in in the month that you want to to do this because the 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 code is very cold there and you have the pregnancy rate the 36 percent when you transfer these vitrified embryos and you can see here if you you use the 13 bulls and do you have some bulls that produce more embryos than another bull that produce lower uh, rate embryos? Then you can conclude that the ovum pickup, I think not in Brazil, but in, in all the parts of the world, improved a lot in the last two decades. And you can see the variation uh, between the breed, donor, sire, and the interaction with donor and sire. And now, uh, I think the, all, the, all the labs uh, will increase the system of the in, culture, in vitro culture with lower oxygen and uh, in the, um, first in the IVM and the IBC and some lab uh, work in the old staff and you have a uh, good result with this. And then I think it, this is uh, the, the information that I'd like to, to, to pass. And I invite everybody to, to participate. The SBTE online in the next month in, in all the parts of the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ada, for an excellent uh, talk covering the various factors affecting the in vitro embryo production. And as you rightly said, I mean, uh, those who are really working in the IVF field in India, uh, and now, I mean, this time they've got an opportunity to do online and they should go on this between 13th to 15th of August, attend this uh, conference. And I feel it's one of the best uh, conference in IVF for embryo transfer in the world. So they should go online on thir between 13th to 15th of August and attend this. Now I will be inviting our next uh, speaker, uh, Jane Fire. I mean, uh, let me brief her about, give her some brief introduction about her. She is a reproductive embryologist from Texas, United States, Bachelor of Science in Animal Science, and an associate degree as an animal technician registered from the uh, uh, Ross State, uh, Ross State University, Alpine, Texas. Worked with the Granada genetics in areas of bovine embryo freezing, splitting, sexing, IVF, and was instrumental in being the first technician to do embryo clone the cattle. She worked as a lab director with Ultimate Genetics in 1996 to 1999, which is 1998, parented with a uh, Cygra and advanced cell technology to produce the first transgenic clone calves. In 1999, she was employed as a research associate in Texas A&M University, where she played a key role in cloning the first cat and boar goat. In 2001, she became self-employed, working as a private consultant and technician instructor for several ET facilities, OVA Genics and Brazo Valley Genetics, Ovita Biotechnology, Advanced Genetic Services, Transova Genetics, Jacob Bova Genics in India, as well as other private institutions and universities. She has authorized and co-authored many peer-reviewed abstracts and articles affiliated with the American Embryo Transfer Association and International Embryo Transfer Society. And uh, Jane uh, is also like Yeda and Jane. These are the renowned reproductive uh, biologists known all over the world. I now request Jane to uh, cover the, the two aspects uh, as she wanted to do on the semen evaluation and the uh, quality control aspects, which are very important part of the IVF. Over to Jen. 
Liz. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And Good. again, it's a privilege and a blessing to be here with you today. As Dr. Zawar has alluded to, um, I had the privilege of uh, our paths crossing many years ago. And once again, the Lord brought us together. And here we are uh, working with the Indian uh, population on IVF in cattle and helping him and his company, JK Bovigenics, uh, to succeed in this. And it's very exciting work to see that uh, in another country that we were um, privileged to help with. And so today, as, as Yeda has alluded to already, uh, and she was great in showing the differences and uh, between donors and sires and other things that affect reproduction, um, I'm going to look at it from more of a technology in the lab experience. So I'm taking the veterinarians from the outside and bringing them inside today. And I'm just gonna look at two factors, only two that improve IVF embryo production. There are of course many contributing factors and we know that. And Yeda alluded to that. And uh, I believe Julia is gonna probably allude to some of that as well on the water buffalo. But I'm going to look mostly at semen evaluation post thaw and then days prior to IVF, you know that client, he or she doesn't really care about why it's very successful, but they wanna know why it didn't work, okay? And this is one part of that. As we know, semen is different in between donors and within lots themselves. And what I mean by that is that there are different dates that the semen's collected and they're given certain lot numbers. And I know there's differences between um, fertilization rates. I've seen it happen before. I had one bull that uh, we used many, many times, and he was very good. We were establishing 30 to 40% development rates. And then we switched and used a different lot number, same bull. And those rates went from 30% to 35 down to 15% or worse. And there was a difference and it was called the lot. And we see that a lot in our business. And so from one unit of semen, we're gonna thaw prior to IVF, days before, we're gonna look at that difference. And I like to look at different lots from that same sire to see if we can get a better grouping of semen. The next thing I like to look at is motility and progressive motility. And in just a few minutes, I'm gonna cover all these in slides. We're gonna look at live dead stain, we're gonna look at abnormalities, what happens to the semen when it's mishandled. And we're also gonna determine hemocytometer counts, both from the straw and the pellet point of view. The second item I'd like to cover and factor is quality control. And there's gonna be a lot of things I'm going to discuss in that as well. Um, we're gonna look at semen, media, oocytes, equipment, clean room, et cetera. And the last thing um, I'm gonna hit home with is the standard, standard Operating Procedures Manual, or SOPs. So let's get started. When I thaw a unit of semen, I wanna verify it twice. So you can see here, I am holding the semen with a hemostat, just right above the liquid nitrogen. I'm also looking at the lot number and I'm identifying this is the sire I wanna use. Uh, so I look at him at least twice before I place him in the warm box at 35, the water box at 35 degrees Celsius. And again, it depends on whether it's a half cc straw, which I do 45 to 60 seconds at that temperature, or a quarter cc straw, which is 30 to 45 seconds. Once the straw is thawed and wiped, I deposit the semen, the, excuse me, then either in a microtube or something that I can keep it warm. And then from there, I'll take it and place it uh, about eight microliters, depending on the cover slip size. This is an 18 millimeter, so I'm using about eight microliters in a micro drop. Again, it needs to be warmed. And this is an example here. He's gonna get going in just a minute. Here we go, um, of a very good sire that we used in the lab, uh, very ultra rapid um, movement. You can see he's probably close to 90% modal plus, um, very uh, linear, which we wanna see. We wanna see them swimming in a straight line and very, very active here. So that was motility and we look for that and we count several parts of the slide, but then we wanna know again, whether or not they are swimming linear in a straight line 
or are they swimming in circles in a circular motion? These that swim in circles, one, if we use them for artificial insemination, won't reach the oviduct for fertilization. But even in IVF, these that swim like this will not fertilize. So we take a number on that. So the next parameter here that I can identify for the semen is we actually do a live dead stain. So I'll take equal parts of the eosin negrosin stain along with my drop of semen, mix them together and make a nice smear here, as you can see, like you would do normally in the blood work. And you can buy this um, uh, type of media here from a company here in the United States, or you can make it yourself. And so under oil immersion at 100x objective, then we can determine live and dead. And the way this stain works is if the membranes are intact, like this one is here, it is live and it doesn't absorb the stain. However, if the membranes are not intact, as you can see in this head of the sperm cell, it will absorb the stain and therefore it is dead. So I put a little rhyme to that, red is dead and live is white. And from that, I'll do a count and I'll do about 10 to 15 fields of view and then do a count live dead and get a percentage of how many live or dead cells are in that post thawed semen unit. That'll give me an idea of what I have to work with uh, after I spin it down. And then I'll, from that same smear, I'll do the same thing, go back through the field of view, keeping away from the edges where most of the dead cells are going to end up, end up in the middle and do again another 10 to 15 fields of view to acquire at least 100 count. And so I can look at now abnormalities. And you can see this one is not abnormal. The head looks really good. The neck, very, uh, no abnormalities here. Of course, I didn't get all of it in the, in the photograph, but he was, this, this sperm cell was normal, but you can see this one is bent. And that occurs one of two ways. Actually, I can, I can do that. I can um, place that semen slide and uh, super cool it. And if I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll cause these bent tail situations and I don't wanna do that. So if my stage warmer is not warm correctly, or if I mishandle the semen, this can happen. This can happen also on the other end when the sire was collected if he was mishandled in such a way. Uh, some of this can happen through osmolarity. Changes can shock them, cold shock, handling incorrectly. Also, I've seen um, people, unfortunately, thaw a unit of semen incorrectly by just picking it up right out of the nitrogen and taking a look at it in the air for a very long time. And that's killing semen right there. And then they'll place it in the warm box or actually put it right back in the liquid nitrogen. So if you bought that sire unit, you might, not be successful for that straw when you thaw it. Here's some more abnormal um, morphological structures on the uh, sperm cells. This one here is called a shoe hook and it actually rotates back on itself. So this actually happens in the epididymis. I, I can't do that. Um, same thing with this distal cytoplasmic dropout. You can see it right here. It actually starts here at the neck and works its way out. And one or two indications uh, occur from these droplets is that either the sire was collected very, very young. He was a very young calf and they collected him. And so therefore the semen is not mature enough at that point in time. Or uh, they collected him very, um, the interval of collection was very uh, quick. So they might have collected him on Monday, then turned right back again around and collected him on say a Thursday, three days later. And so the semen didn't have enough time to truly mature in the epididymis. And uh, so this is the stain method. You can also use a fixative method and look at the acrosome uh, region of the head of the sperm. As you can see on this picture, and thank you, Dr. John Parrish for allowing me to use his slide. You can see that the head here, the acrosome is intact um, with a coiled entity and a droplet on the end. So there are other methods of staining and observing sperm at this, at this level. And so what I do is, as you can see, I've put together a poster. And normally when I train and work with companies, uh, in this case, India, as you can see down here, uh, I'll put together a poster for them and allow for, uh, you as a technician sometimes to, to identify some of these abnormalities that sometimes you don't always see every day. 
Uh, when I see head abnormalities, craters, knobbed pyroform, these abnormalities, if they're greater than 10%, if I see 50, 60, 70% head abnormalities, I'm concerned. That's normally a genetic problem. And so I can't correct that. And so uh, I look for that. Uh, anything below 10%, you're gonna have a few, I'm not too concerned. Same thing with the tail abnormalities or neck, that's mostly in the epididymis or mishandling. I think we can help with some of that in the, in the lab. So, and of course down here's your normal one. Uh, so the posters really do help. I have it right there by the microscope. You can look up and take a peek when you do, do your uh, evaluations. And one of the last part of the elevate, uh, evaluations, uh, second to last anyway, I have one, this is the hemocytometer counts. What's real important about that is I can get uh, a concentration count on that, on that unit in the straw post-thaw immediately. So for instance, uh, an average, our conventional semen here in the United States, uh, half cc straws are normally packed with about 30 million concentration. That's total, that's not live. And so we hope that we get 30 million, but we know when we thaw a unit of semen that approximately 50% can die. And we see that sometimes. So that's what I look for on my motility, progressive motility and live dead stain. I wanna see, I wanna see a higher percentage of that because once I spin that pellet down, once I spin the semen down through a, a sperm gradient like Yeda showed us in one of her slides, then I get a nice pellet and that pellet is indicative now of the live sperm that I have to use for IVF. And so we do our counts both before and after. And so the pellet count, of course, and when we do that, we count these diagonal center uh, squares and we do counts like this, and this is what you're gonna see. And uh, again, I'm not gonna go over the details of counting, but it's important that we know uh, what we have, so especially when we do that pre-drop prior to centrifugation because, and one reason is, we don't know if we have a really small pellet, was he packed less or were they all dead uh, prior to looking at that pellet? That's an indication. That's why that pre-drop prior to centrifuging down is so important for that reason. Again, I like to look at the semen days before I do IVF. So if I have a problem, I can then contact that client and ask them, do you have an alternative for me to use? He doesn't look like he's gonna work very good for you. And so we can, again, increase our production rate that way. Again, I, I ask my clients, please send me two to three units per, per uh, designated principal and secondary. And that way I have a backup for them on the day that we have to do IVF. Lastly, and I didn't bring a slide for this uh, on the semen evaluation, is that we can actually take and utilize this information two weeks before IVF, using it on oocytes that we collect from the slaughterhouse. And so what we do and what I normally like to do is to order or acquire, it's, it's cheaper to acquire them if you're close to a slaughterhouse, is to uh, gain yourself 300 oocytes, let's just say, divide them equally into three units up to 100 each, and then assign either a concentration of semen, say a half a million to one million to two, and then do IVF, take half of those the next day, put them in culture, the other half you're gonna stain and you're looking for penetration rates. And the pronuclei will, uh, will shine up blue when you use it under UV light and then you can identify and see what concentration of semen, semen gave you the highest fertilization rate. And then on the end, endpoint seven days later, you're looking at also, here's a quality control measure. Am I, is my incubator working correctly? Um, or is my media working correctly? And what kind of blastocyst rates do I have with the concentrations I'm using? Now I'm maximizing my production rate with that sire, hopefully with that donor. Like Yede alluded to, there are so, uh, di uh, sire and donor differences and we see that. And now I'd like to go on to the next part. And for most of us, we don't like to talk about quality control, but you know what? It'll make or break a lab like I spoke of earlier. That client is happy when you can produce lots of embryos and they won't question you, but they'll question you when you don't make the embryos they expected. And they're gonna wanna know why it didn't work. And if you don't have good quality control measures in place, 
then you'll never be able to tell them and they'll look for somebody else. So let's look at some of those measures. All right, we talk about temperature and incubator temperature and gas. So for the most part, we need to know if the temperature on the, say the thermostat is reading 25 degrees Celsius in your lab, is that correct? Do you have a certified thermometer that will validate that? That's real important. Same thing with incubators. They'll have a digital that says 38 and a half, and I've had this happen to me before, where in fact the, the, um, the, the internal temperature of that incubator was not 38 and a half. In fact, it was 39 to 40, and it was killing my oocytes, and I didn't even know. But I checked that every week, and I caught it before we had to use it. Same thing with incubator gas. It says 5% CO2. Is that correct? Same thing, um, Dr. Zawar, his lab, we uh, have them set up with these benchtop incubators, and they're already pre-programmed or pre gas for a 5590. But you know, you can test that as well with your fire ride. You can hook it up. Is it reading correctly? And so therefore, always check that. Media. During culture, we have a media drop as a control. Um, if you have a problem in your IVF or in your culture, is it coming from your media? And unless you have a control drop, then you won't know. Is the oocyte, is it the sire, or is it the media? Lot numbers. We know that Every time you buy immediate, uh, there may be a different lot. That's real important. I can, I can assure you, I can ask Dr. Zawar right now, what did you eat a week ago? And you won't be able to tell me. But if you wrote down what you did eat, then you would be able to tell me. And this is the same procedure that we use in the lab. You need to write these things down because you won't remember. pH changes, the media should be able to tell you that. Uh, protective wear, we're used to that now, aren't we? But um, protective wear in the lab, uh, it's good to wear that mask or hair net or even lab coats, of course, designated shoes and so forth. Again, semen, we've talked about that. Um, oocytes, uh, Yada had some good pictures of oocytes before and after. And it's important to notice any abnormalities. Look at that cytoplasm. Uh, is, it, is it nice and uniform? Does it look vacuole? Is it dark and splotchy? Uh, quality of the oocytes. We know the, the higher the quality, Yada had another good slide on that. The higher the quality, the, the more embryo production you're going to make. And also contamination. What kind of contamination? Is it bacterial or is it spores or funguses? Alarm systems. Uh, we know about those, don't we, Dr. Zawar? Uh, you run a generator, you better be sure you have a generator to back up that generator. Uh, same thing in the United States. When our electricity goes out, it never fails. I have an incubator full of embryos. And so therefore, I need to have a backup and that would be a generator. We also have alarms on liquid nitrogen tanks or uh, freezers and we have a system called the sensor phone that will call you. It's nice to hear the alarm when you're in the lab but lots of times you're at home and it never fails. It's on the weekend when you just left from work and you'll get a phone call saying there's a problem. You can go back and catch it in time. And then microscopes, keep them clean, wipe them down, use them correctly and uh, and if you do wipe them down, be sure if, if you use alcohol to wipe it completely clean uh, and use it only on the glass and not on the rubber. Rubber will crack. A few other things we're gonna go over briefly is your pipetters. You know, when's the last time you looked at the end of that pipetter? What's up in there? Did it get dirty? And if you're using that and you're not changing your tips, then you're contaminating the H well that you go into. And so changing your tips are important. Countertops, I like to use a product called OO Safe. Uh, it's non-alcoholic and oocytes didn't seem to bother them. However, if you don't have that and you have 70% alcohol and you have to use something to disinfect, then be sure you wipe it clean because when it dries and you don't wipe it, then it leaves a residual and we don't want that. Uh, here I am talking, but of course, if I'm working over the microscope, I don't want to talk, eat, or chew anything because again, we know that that can contaminate wells. Log books. Like we talked earlier, I spoke just a minute ago about what did you do last week. If you don't write down, when's the last time you calibrated your incubator? Uh, how about your hood is it certified? What about your pipe headers? Are they calibrated? Are they working correctly? Do you know how to correctly calibrate them yourself? Um, so all that can be written down in books and you can go back historically, historically and, and, and look at the progress. How, how, how long does it take you to go through that cylinder of gas? If we record each and every time the pressure every week, you know, I'm going through, uh, let's say in about uh, eight weeks, it takes me to run through uh, a cylinder. 
then I know I got to be prepared to have one ordered four weeks prior to that. All this plays into acquiring a good working uh, atmosphere for your lab. Medias, again, and your chemicals, all your lot numbers, write them down and date it when you open a bottle. Write it on that bottle. And who opened it? And when was it opened? When's the expiration date? These are critical, critical in maintaining a good environment and working. If you were to paint your lab, what kind of paints do you use? We want to use low volatile organic compound paints, white that are latex, not petroleum based, water based uh, paints or caulk. Uh, we take that for granted. Why? Because whatever you bring into the lab, the oocyte and embryo sees and smells. You know, I tell my students, please don't wear cologne. Please don't wear uh, perfume into the lab. Those are volatile organic compounds. Those go into the incubator. And some of my students can wear them quite heavily, I might say. Uh, lighting, dimmable, non-uvable, UV emitting fluorescent tubes that are covered can be used in the lab. Uh, they emit less light. Fluorescent tubes emit more light than normal bulbs, but less heat. And so that's important in the lab. And last, and we're going to sum it all up with this, quality control of of your standard operating procedures. You know, the technician can be a variable and we don't want that. And so we can eliminate that by training them and have everybody do the same thing. And so we, if we run into a problem, then that problem is not because of that technician, but it's because of a, a media issue, uh, poor oocytes, poor quality semen, things that we can now, via the quality control measures I've just laid before you, identify the problems, and then we have a place to start and fix those problems. And so, as you can see, I've created many SOPs for Dr. Looney and other companies, but um, it's important that you have them and keep them updated. As we know, things progress, and uh, we always strive to get better, and that's what these seminars and these webinars are doing for you right now, is helping you to get better in this field of IVF and embryo technology. And with that, I'd like to thank the one true God who's allowed me the privilege and, and uh, a blessing to being here. Thank you, Dr. Sham Zawar and all of JK Bovagenics and JK Trust for entrusting me with this time with you. And with that, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jane, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I mean, uh, both of you, both the, uh, both the reproductive embryologists have really, Yeda and yourself have covered so many important topics and given the tips to all of us, small, small tips which will really play a very important role in getting the best of the in vitro production of the embryos. And we're really grateful to you for uh, covering so many things in extreme details. Both of you are really, again, once again, uh, thank you very much, Jane. Uh, for uh, sparing your valuable time, getting up so early and uh, educating us on these uh, very small but very important things. Now well, you know we, what, Dr. Dr. Zawar, you know, you can give me a little more than 10 minutes and we can sure cover maybe in another webinar, many other yeah. topics. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And Thank you. I, I'm really thrilled with this webinar and I'm sure uh, uh, we, will, we will have another one uh, to, to, uh, to really get going and have much and much more IVF work done as our uh, Honorable Animal Husbandry Commissioner has told us to take this technology and bring down the cost all over the country. Now I invite our uh, uh, next speaker, Dr. Julia. Uh, let me introduce her. Uh, she is a postdoctoral from Federal University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She is doctorate in animal reproduction from University of Sao Paulo, USP with a sandwich period at the University of Sydney, Australia. She's a master in animal science from State of University, uh, and she's a graduate in veterinary medicine. She has an experience in the area of biotechnologies applied to the reproduction of female bovine and buffaloes with an emphasis on controlling follicular development and ovulation, fixed time artificial insemination, ultrasound, embryo production and transfer. She has attended numerous trainings, undertaken many research projects, and published huge number of articles which I have seen it. And she was really helpful to us when we visited uh, uh, their farm last August. Uh, 
And from there, as I told you, we brought, we got some tips and that's how we immediately after coming, I really uh, continuously followed up and she was very helpful along with Elcio in guiding us and making our first trial of Buffalo successful. Thanks to you, Julia, once again, and over to you for this uh, next presentation, please. Thank you, Dr. Shian Zawar. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, we can share your presentation and start. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great you, pleasure. Uh, can you put it into PPT mode, I think? Is it in PPT? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay now? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you once again, Dr. Shian Zawar. It's a great pleasure to be here with you in this afternoon in India. So, good afternoon, everyone in India and around the world that are listening to our webinar. So today we will talk about biotechnologies for in vitro embryo production in buffaloes. In the last 10 years, according to FAO, the growth rate of buffalo herd in the world was of almost 20%. Also, it was increased in milk production about 36.7%. Current in the world, we have approximately 200 million heads of buffaloes around the world. And the annual production of these animals is about 111 million tons of milk. In this context, here in Brazil, we got a growth of bubbling herd of about 18.5 percent and current, according to FAO, our buffalo population is of 1.4 million animals. But data here in Brazil, we have about 3 million animals around the country. Buffalo generally and mainly is selected for milk production, also for meat as well, we know. But we will focus today on milk production of these animals. Of course, we have to focus on the genetics of these animals. For example, we have this animal on the left from Otavio Bernardes, Spinatus dengue, is a family that do a hard process of ge genetic selection of these animals to improve the production of course the milk production. The results of this is the destination of this milk to dairies and to produce many types of cheese. We have famous examples as in Italy we got the famous mozzarella. But here in Brazil and also in other parts of the world, we have the, the many types of cheese being produced for many different farmers. When you do a comparative between buffalo and bovine milk, we can see that buffalo milk has 13% more proteins, 58% more calcium, there is more phosphorus as well, and it's important to note that there is less cholesterol and more dry matter, which you know, we know that it's important for producing milk, for producing cheese. Uh, also, buffalo milk has more vitamins A, D, B2, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium when we compare to bovine milk. So the properties of buffalo milk are huge important and we have to explore more for healthy and for human in general. But we know that to produce pro productivity control, we have to be associated with genetic improvement and also with reproduction biotechnologies. Because just, because just through the reproduction biotechnologies, we can improve the genetic and spread the animals of great merit in the herd. For this, in buffaloes especially, we can use the biotechnologies of reproduction and we can talk about three main uh, biotechnologies. One of them is the time of artificial insemination that we have different managements and protocols 
for breeding and non-breeding season, the multiple ovulation and embryo transfer or super ovulation. And today we will talk about the in vitro embryo production or in vitro fertilization. So embryo production in buffaloes, how it occurred? We know that uh, embryos are produced also in vivo and in vitro as well. So I will talk just briefly about the in vivo produce, production in, in, in buffalo, and then we will talk about the in vivo, just to know uh, why we migrate, why we are migrating to this technology. When you produce embryos in vivo, uh, when you make a comparison between buffalo and cattle, in buffalo, we have about six transferable embryos per collection. And considering a conception rate of 50%, we have three pregnancies per flush, approximately. But in buffalo, we have approximately two embryos per flush. And considering a conception rate about 30%, we have 0.5 pregnancies per flush. Mm. So results are not very efficient to apply this technique in buffalo. Our last attempted in superovulation was administrating PGF during the periovulatory period to increase the fertilization rates in superovulated buffaloes. The main hypothesis of this, this study was that PGF would increase the captation of the oocytes in the, uh, through the ovaries and the fibrin, and, fibrin, and then we have more embryos produced. We saw that the fertilization rate was better, was great when using PGF in superovulation protocol. But the total embryonic estrogens were not improved, and the number of embryos produced was still low. So, because of these results in superovulation, we are trying different approaches to produce embryos in buffalo. And one of these is the in vitro embryo production. Just to have a parameter, a parameter talking about economics, because we know that the applying of technologies is directly related to economic uh, evolution. Uh, we can see that since 2000 to 2014, we have an increase of, sorry, we have an increase of more than 300% in the use of this technology, according to IETE. And especially in Brazil, today we can see a huge increase in the use, a huge increase in the use of this technology. And almost 90% of the embryos produced here are from IVF. But also, when you have a lot, a large numbers, number of embryos, we need a large number of recipients as well, because you have to transfer these embryos to finish the, the, all, the whole cycle to produce uh, to generate uh, an efficient production system. So we need a large number of viable recipients to do that as well. And uh, when, you, when you make a global parameter, we see that here in Brazil, we produce 60% of the, the all, all embryos produced in the world are produced in Brazil. And I just show this, not to show, uh, especially uh, to talk about Brazil, but to talk about India. In India, you have a huge herd from cattle and from buffalo as well. So the participation of India in this market could increase a lot. You have a great potential to improve your production and in whole aspect, uh, talking about embryo production and also embryo transfer. Talking now directly about the technique in buffalo, they often pick up, as Professor Dr. Shen uh, talked in his lecture, you, we, you do a follicular aspiration guided by ultrasound. Here we have Bernardo. He works here in Brazil. He's a very good professional working with buffalo and cattle as well. And the process is very, very similar to cattle. The, the in vitro embryo production initiates with the aspiration, where the technique will do, you will aspirate the follicles to achieve the oocytes, 
And this process is very similar to Pedro, like I said, and we just have to attempt about the, the small difference, um, mainly regarding the anatomy of these animals to do this process, like size of the ovaries, position of the ovaries and of the uterus as well. Uh, then the oocytes go to washing in oocyte selection, the same in, in cattle. And forward to the in vitro maturation, in vitro fertilization, and in vitro culture, where we will see the development of the embryos and keep the blastocyst stage for transfer. Uh, also talking about buffaloes especially, when you, we apply a technology, we have to understand the difference and the particularities inherent to the species. In Buffalo, Pietro Baruzelli and his group, the group uh, that I made part of during the, the, the study, my PhD, for example, we did many studies comparing the physiology, the anatomy, the endocrinology of Buffalo with cattle. Always comparing Los Indicos, in this case, Nelori, Holstein, Mosaurus, and Buffalo. Here we had the Muva Buffaloes. And what we saw was that you can see, I'm, I'm sure that there are many vets uh, that already aspirated Nelori cows, for example, and we have huge population of follicles when you are doing the aspiration. Completely different from Holstein. But what you can see is that Buffalo is very similar to Holstein when talking about visualized follicles, all sites recovered, cleavage embryos, and also blastocyst production. So we can see a similarity between these two species uh, for embryo production. Here, just to demonstrate again, that buffalo has about 12 follicles uh, retrieved uh, during the aspiration, and few animals present a large population of follicles in the ovaries. Considering this, uh, today we know that we are using a lot a selection of donors by antrofollicular population. This predictive selection is made by AMH, the Ansmillerian hormone. The hypothesis was that the increased antrofollicular population, animals with this high population have high AMH circulating concentrations, and then they would respond better for in vitro embryo production. Uh, the, same, the same type of study was made in Pietro, Pietro Baruzelli's lab, and they, they compared uh, in, dif in different, in the same farm management and nutrition conditions, Holstein, Gear, and Buffalo. And again, was verified that Gear had a great antropolicular population and together with plasma AMH concentrations and buffalo, moha especially here, and host and cows were similar for antropolicular population and also AMH concentrations. This graph is just showing the similarity again between Holstein and, and buffalo and gear completely different about the plasma AMH and follicular population. Another important factor when we consider selecting donors, buffalo donors, for example, like in cattle, is the, the number of all types per OPU. And then we have, have to consider the follicular population. So when we evaluate, evaluate animals with low, medium, and high follicular population, we can see that animals with high follicular population, they have greater probability of produce more oocytes or, or recover more oocytes from OPU. This is a direct correlation that we can verify. So it's important to select donors. This is just a study that we made about the reference gene selection for gene expressions analysis of all sites collected from dairy cattle and buffaloes during winter and summer. This study is, is just for emphasize the question of seasonality in buffalo. We won't talk about it today, but we know that 
in many countries there is a difference of the seasonality. So the quality of your food sites will be different in winter and summer. But many studies are required, more studies are required to clarify these questions and how it works in the world. Then the treatments to improve the in vitro and reproduction in buffaloes uh, were made several studies here in Brazil, uh, mainly with Professor Pietro Baruzelli and Nelson, to study how it occurs in buffaloes. And the last result we had, the best results and the last result we had talking about in vitro and reproduction in these species was using the, e the FSH, the follicle stimulating hormone, for opioid in buffaloes. We know that it had been used in cattle, and in buffalo, the result seems to be positive. We used the super stimulation prior to the ovum pickup to improve the in vitro reproduction in muliparous, primiparous, and multiparous buffalo cows. Uh, so we evaluated three categories of animals to use this protocol. Uh, we know that the success of OPU IVP, it's directly correlated with the all site quantity and all site quality as well. But it's important to know the characteristics of females, bubalus, bubalis, especially here we can talk about muha because to apply the technologies, we have to consider the difference in each animal. Muha, buha, and buffalo females, they have low number of ovarian follicles, as you saw, and a low number of viable oocytes in coverage per view. The FSH, or super simulation treatment, successfully was used in IVEP programs in cattle, and what's the basis of the use of the FSH? Is to grant it a greater diameter of aspirated follicles, to grow a homogeneous follicular population, and then we covered all sides with competence for IVP procedures. So, like us, like I said, we use it three categories. We use heifers, primiparous, and multiparous. Why three categories? to spread the technology, to be able to use this technology in all buffaloes of the herd. So we use a, pro a simple protocol with a stradiol benzoate and progesterone, and we did the super stimulation of these animals with FSH or not during the, in for decreasing doses. The results were that for viable Sites rate, embryos produced per OPU, and blastocyst rates, the results was, were better for animals that were super related with, with FSH prior to OPU. And also, we verified that in control animals, we can see a large number of follicles, of small follicles, and the animals treated with FSH, we can see that a decrease in the number of small follicles and a greater proportion of medium and large follicles for aspiration. So we can see that here we have two ovaries and in control group we saw that the animals presented a large number of small follicles and the super simulated groups a larger, a, a greater proportion of medium and, high, and large diameter follicles. Just to demonst demonstrate when aspirating, this is the ovary non super simulated, the control animals with small follicles, right? And here is the ovary with uh, a greater proportion of medium and large size diameter follicles for aspiration. So there's a, a huge difference and it will have uh, different effects on the all side quality as well. In the end, we saw that FSH did not increase the number of ovarian follicles, but it increased the diameter and the proportion of medium follicles. 
The cops recoveries from follicles with larger diameter, they have greater potential comp uh, developmental comp competence when compared to cocks from smaller follicles. So it's, it is also a positive effect of using the FSH. And the main conclusions about this, this, this study was that it increases the proportion of medium and large diameter follicles available for OPU procedure, and also increases the proportion of viable oocytes for cuter, having greater blastocyst rates and producing for OPU IVEP session. So the super stimulation with FS prior to OPU increases the efficiency of IVEP and buffalo donors. Another factor that we evaluated here uh, in Brazil that affects the OPU IVEP efficiency in buffalo, like in cattle, the farm has a great influence in these results. The category of the animals, you can see a, a, a difference between oliferous, piniferous, and multiferous. And the reproductive stats, stats like pregnant and non-pregnant animals at the OPU process. Also, the bull is very important to evaluate, like Jane talked earlier, and we have a few difference, like blastocyst rates of almost 40% against blastocyst rates of 7%, depending on the bull used for producing embryos. So the quality of the semen is very important to apply this technology. And the OPU efficiency in Buffalo, we got about nine viable oocytes recovered. We consider a blastocyst rate, rate of 30%. We got three embryos and in a conception rate of 30%, almost one pregnancy per OPU IV procedure. But uh, when you talk about the production of embryos, you have to talk about the transfer of this, this, these embryos because it's not just the, the cycle is not just to produce embryos, it's a hard challenge to produce embryos, we know, but also we have to transfer and achieve success in pregnancy rate of these products. So talking briefly about the recipients, we have to consider that we verified here in Brazil, these data are from Brazil and some countries of Latin America, that the conception rate according to the farm is different. We have a total, meet, uh, total average of 30% of conception rate, but there are farms with 20% and farms with 50%. We know that is directly related with nutritional condition and also sanitary condition. So we have to control all the managers to have success applying technology and being efficient in our results. We, we evaluate as well here uh, with Nelsio and Professor Pietro, the conception of pregnancy rates according to animal category. And again, using heifers, primiferous, and multiferous cows. And we verify that we, there is no difference between the, follicle, the follicles in the, uh, the 11, the 17, and also on CL diameter of these animals for uh, responding to the protocol. And the ovulation rate, conception rate, and pregnancy rate were similar between the three categories used. So the embryo transfer, the protocol for embryo transfer, it, it works in all categories of buffaloes for transferring embryos. Today, we use a protocol of 18 days where the day 11 of the recipients is the, the day of the OPU of the donors. And you can control this and complete the whole process using this, this both protocols. And so the time and embryo transfer program, we can say that in a herd of 100 synchronized recipients, this is a slide from Professor Pietro Baruzelli, uh, consider our utilization rate of 75%. So having 75 embryo transfers, considering a conception rate of 30% having 23 pregnancies in this herd. And our main conclusions about the use of this technology in Buffalo is that 
the reproductive particularities of the buffalo after considering that the, after the success of assisted biotechnologies is that studies demonstrate clearly the potential of this technique to become a commercially applicable technology in buffalo i'm sure that in india and around the country you have all the tools to develop this technology produce embryo, transfer embryos and be successful with the pregnancy rates and increase the milk production and the economy of the, the, the farmers and the company in general having success and applying this technique with efficiency. So thank you very much about for the opportunity to exchange experience and the opportunity to talk to people from India and around the world. Thank you, Dr. Xian Zawar and everybody listening to us. Thank you very much, Julia, for an excellent overview of the IVF in buffaloes and we should plan a trip to India as quickly as possible and give us more, share your more experience with us. Now we are almost coming close to the presentation and before I, I think it should be possible for our Annual Husbandry Commissioner to conclude it, but before that, let me take some question and answer. There are a lot of question and answers are, the questions are there. And we will just quickly go through it and just see, I think uh, the, one of the common question which I noticed is that many people wanted to have the recording and the presentation of this whole program. So I'm just telling for information of everybody, this will be done this evening itself and tomorrow, Morning, you will be able to see it on the YouTube link of JK Trust, the complete program, whatever is there, and the recording and the, uh, the speech from our esteemed uh, speakers. Uh, the first question, I'm just taking it quickly. One is from uh, Hanumant, uh, his name. When would you conduct the training in IVF? We are very keen to start it as quickly as possible. We are just waiting for this, some relaxation from the, our uh, COVID-19 situation. Sir, what is the cost of producing one IV of female embryo? And in, under Indian context, you know, it will take, it will cost you around 10,000 rupees to produce one IV of female embryo. Looks like aspiration of, another question from Vaibhav, looks like the aspiration of oocyte to the needle is an invasive method which might be causing tissue damage at ovary. If it is a case, what effect the needle uh, aspiration have on further working capacity of that ovary? I think Charles being the I'll, I'll ask Charles to reply to this question. Uh, Charles, could you get my question? Your you. mic is, your mute, uh, unmute your mic, yeah. Yeah, can you repeat it? Yeah, the question is, looks like the aspiration of oocyte through needle is an invasive method, which might be causing tissue damage at ovary. If it is the case, what effects the needle aspiration have on further working capacity of that ovary. Yeah, it it's it sure looks like if you watch the aspiration technique for the first time, you would think there's a lot more potential damage, but it seems like the ovary is real resilient and you don't see a whole lot of uh, problems with it. We've aspirated one cow for a period of over two years on a routine basis, at least on bi-weekly, I mean, every other week method. And uh, we saw very little d damage to the ovary. It does become in encapsulated. Seems like there's less damage with the unstimulated compared to stimulated. There's, there's quite a lot of frank blood, but uh, seems like, um, very little. Seems like there's only one or two cows that will actually be damaged or even lose one, probably because of some clotting factor disorders. Uh, really not, uh, it's not a big a, a causative effect of, uh, of damage to the ovary at all. So there's been quite a lot of studies with that. And uh, I don't think it's a big concern. Thank you, Charles. Uh, another question is from Dr. Javed Khan. Which breeds you are collecting the oocytes? Uh, Javed, we have been working on various 
indigenous breeds, as I told you, almost all, a lot of indigenous breeds and even Olstein and Jersey. So we have been working on different breeds, which, uh, which breeds have given the better results. Uh, among the indigenous breeds, we are getting with the boss indicus, as I told you, uh, they have always a large follicular population. So we are getting quite good results uh, with the indicus uh, breeds. Then, sir, I would like to know that whether the OPU or IVF can be used for production of superior quality bulls in our country and meeting the shortage of the bulls. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, through IVF, we can definitely produce very good bulls and uh, superior quality bulls to meet the requirement of our country. Why the response of Boss Indicus is better as compared to Boss Taurus? Uh, that is a question specifically asked to Yeda. So Yeda, you should reply. The question is, what is the why the response of Boss Indicus is better as compared to Boss Taurus? Uh, then you can see the, the difference. The difference is the population of the, 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 the follicular. And you can see, and Julia uh, talk about this too. It's it is you have a lot of of the oocyte in Bosnia who compare the the Bosnians, okay. But you have you can see you can saw in some graph that you have some some Holstein like Holstein that you have one hundred oocyte too. Then if you selected the this donor for the a a a the anti-millerian anti hormone to select the, the donors that you have a high quantity of the oocyte, then you can, you can produce more embryos. But the quality of this, this embryo, it's, it's, it's okay for the lower or the event. Then, and sometimes like Hosting, some people like in the United States or in another country, working with a stimulation of this to produce more the quantity of the 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 size of the follicle like julia i think julia can talk about this too. Yeah? the the size of the follicle is better when you do the super super stimulation the stimulation of this with the, with the fsh yeah well, thank you Edith. Considering that the the the, the Nellori and the Holstein and Indicus, it's exactly what he had said. It's about the follicular population. In a Nellori cow, for for example, we can find in one aspiration two hundred all sites when you compare it to a Holstein. So proportionally, we will have more sites and then we have more embryos produced in the end. Now another question is from Bikash Chandranad. While aspirating the oocytes, the needle can make hemorrhage in the ovary or not? I think this question has been more or less replied by Charles. Now, can we get the whole webinar presentation? Uh, that's what I already told. It will be put in the YouTube link. Uh, then uh, uh, the another question is, during the course of semen examination, will it not increase the number of dead cells by the time we use it for IVF? I think Jen, uh, you should be <laughs> you uh, during the course of semen examination will it not increase the number of dead cells by the time we use it for ivf a uh, question from uh, nidhishri please all right good question now that depends on whether or not the client has allowed you to thaw one straw for you to do the evaluation without doing ivf if you don't have that opportunity to prior uh, evaluate the semen before IVF, then you have to do it at the same time. And so I would thaw the unit of semen and prepare it for centrifugation. But prior to placing it in the perk hall, I would do my smear, I would do my motility drop, and I can do a count briefly. I can take just a little bit of semen from that thawed unit prior to spinning it down. And so after I do my IVF, I can go back and do my uh, live dead stain and abnormalities, but it's it's after the fact. So to really maximize that semen, I want to know what it's going to do before I see the oocytes and not during or after. So it's up to the client whether or not I can use one straw, I call burning a straw and not doing IVF on. Uh, so sometimes, a lot of times I call it shotgun. I have to do it all at the same time. 
And yes, if I am slow, uh, then I can hinder, but I don't. My oocytes come first. Motility, we check first. Do your smear, look at that later. Do your IVF and come back and check your abnormalities and your live dead. Then uh, you can combine the two and hopefully you're successful in guessing what that concentration needs to be. Thank you, Jen. Uh, another question, did JK Bova Genix tried all three steps, IVM, IVF, and IVC under low oxygen concentration? If so, what was the result? Thank you in an anticipation. Yeah, we, we have been using the low oxygen concentration, only 5% oxygen, and we are getting quite good results. And as I told you, we are touching to about 30% blastocyst rate. And I think we, over time, we should be increasing that blastocyst rate also. Now, here is the, I think, uh, quite a Daniel Jacquim, I think he's from Brazil. Hello, how are you? I think this will be question uh, related to uh, uh, Julia. I work in animal reproduction laboratory in Brazil. And in my experience with IVF in Buffalo, we observed an acceleration in embryonic development when compared to bovine species. I would like the speakers to talk a little bit about it and get to know you about this topic. Another point, another point is that in the bulls I used in IVF, I noticed a very high vigor and motility about the best bovine bulls. Was this a coincidence in the semen I used or is it something recurring in buffalo's general hyperactivity of the species? Please. Thanks for the question. Uh, Dr. Shian Zawar was here in, in Brazil with us and the farm working and we talked a lot about this question about the velocity of development of buffalo embryos. So in fact, uh, we have to pay attention, like I said during the lecture, there are some small differences that we have to pay attention when using IVF in buffaloes because of the anatomy, the endocrinology and the physiology of these animals. Most of, most of the procedure is similar to bovine, to cattle, but this, in this part, particularities, we can include this, this effect. Uh, there are studies that show that buffalo embryo is about 24 to 36 hours faster in development comparing to cattle. So, um, we talked with Dr. Shia and about it that generally buffalo, in cattle, so, uh, sorry, in cattle, we evaluate the embryos in day seven and we got the blastocyst. If you need to evaluate the embryos, the buffalo embryos in day seven, we will see lots of hatched blastocysts. So they will they develop faster. So you have to evaluate earlier these embryos because we will find blastocysts on day five, day six. So you have to pay attention to these characters. And about the semen, it can be coincidence because of the quality of the semen that you use it, that of course, when the quality of the semen is higher, you will see this vigor, this motility improved and will be better. Of course, it will generally, it's correlation, it is a positive correlation uh, to embryo production after. I agree. Thank you, Julia. And now the next question is again, if we are collecting 18 to 20 oocytes one time, what is the percentage of number of live blastocysts at the end of the OBC? I mean, you know, uh, when you are getting about 20 oocytes and we are working on 30% blastocyst, we should be getting about six good IVF embryos. Right now, we are averaging, JK Bova Genix is averaging about five IVF embryos per OPO, but that's the ideal. If you get five to six IVF embryos with 30% blastocyst, you should be you should be very happy. And as Yeda has rightly said, that we are looking for at least having about two pregnancies per OPU. That should be the target as on today. Uh, then uh, what is the ideal humidity required in IVF lab? Uh, Jen, can you say something on that? Yes, sir. You don't want it too humid and you don't want it too not. So uh, probably around 30 to 40% humidity is what you're going to look at. You don't want too much because then you're going to grow things other than embryos. And you don't want it too dry either. So the idea here is to stay about 30 to 40% humidity in the lab. Thank you. Now, another question is from Praveen Kumar 
please explain how can you implant embryos in recipient cows? You know, whatever embryos we produce it, they have to be implanted into the synchronized recipients. I mean, it is better you have a maximum close synchrony, plus synchrony is still better than the minus synchrony. So try to have the recipient synchronize on the basis of number of embryos they expect to produce. Uh, then, uh, uh, then there are a lot of questions, but I'll just now cut short because it's getting quite late. Uh, Dr. Jane, do you think using newer methods of semen assessment like CASA can be more efficient for semen analysis than conventional semen analysis methods being followed? Do you, should we use CASA? That's the question. Jane. You can use CASA if you can afford it. And I think yeah. that's, that's <laughs> the, uh, the question here to be answered. It's yes. very expensive. It's a very good quality uh, evaluation. But again, um, for most practitioners, it's the, it's the technician's eyeballs looking in that microscope under, a, micro, uh, under a, a, a slide. And so that's the standardization. I worked for somebody that actually compared his technicians with the CASA on, a, on an annual basis to determine if they were as good. And for the most part, his technicians were getting the correct readings as the CASA was. So he felt confident in what they were seeing. So yeah, you can check them. Like you certified your technicians that way. But there is a very interesting. Yeah, great. Sorry, sorry. There is a very interesting question. Does the short height of a opinion performer, OPU performer, it should be OPU <laughs> performer, will affect the oocyte collection? I don't think uh, if he's of a short height and the cow is taller, he can have some stool to stand and then collect it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, like uh, when Charles does the OPU, he has to, if the cows are not big enough, then he has to bend. Uh, and I don't know what, how Charles will do the OPU of our three feet uh, Kungunur cows, uh, Charles, which are there in India. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, what is the effect of nutrition and age of donor on the oocyte grade? How can we increase the quality of oocytes? You know, that's very important. You should have a good donors and we have discussed this matter in depth. So, is usage of synthetic hormone is anastas cows is fatal to animal if possible? What are the conditions? Please explain. First of all, these anastas cows, I mean, they will not be uh, suitable donors. We have to have the cycling donors to start with. Uh, now, there are those of FSH for superovulation and schedule. Some of the questions we have your email addresses. I'll give my email addresses and if uh, we will uh, able to answer those uh, now because it's getting quite late. But I will just now quickly because the questions are continuously increasing. Uh, I thought I, we are trying to answer the questions, but they are, they are increasing. What practice according to you is the best in IVC? Closing the lead of a four well dish, partially closing the lead or completely opening the lead? Jen? I would suggest that the lid is always on the dish, so that doesn't allow for any contaminants that can float in when you open that door. You know, your hand goes in, and so therefore anything on your arm, whether it's on a lab coat or not, can still drip down into there. So you want the lid on it. You don't want it sealed so the, the um, correct CO2 and oxygen can go into the, the, the mineral oil slash media. And so you want it covered just for that reason. Right. Uh, Julia, this will be for you. Whether you have studied the melatonin in buffalo in relation to oocyte collection, any idea? Can you repeat, please? Whether you have studied melatonin in buffalo in relation to oocyte collection? There are several studies with melatonin in buffalo because we know about the seasonality influence in this species, like in, in goats and sheep. Uh, in sheep especially, and the, uh, in my opinion, we can't, we can't say that we already know exactly what to do with melatonin, because there are controversial studies. Some say, some, some studies say that it's okay, it works, and others say that there is no difference. It depends a lot uh, on the timing that we are using. So this is the, the difficult, the hard point that we have to to discover, we have many types of medium, many types of 
stage of the future of this, this embryos or future of the oocytes, we don't know exactly at the moment that exactly the melaton is important to oocyte quality, to embryo quality, and associated with all of the other components of the medium culture and how we can equalize this to improve the use. But I think that uh, a greater possibility is, to, uh, is a positive effect of the melatonin in the oocyte. And also in semen, for example, we are finishing a study here uh, using melatonin in artificial insemination. But again, controversial results around the world using the melatonin. But I think that there is a great possibility of being positive in the use of melatonin. Thank you, Julia. The, what frequency you can subject one cow for OPO stimulated, unstimulated, you know. We have been trying it. There are a lot of research on this. We have been uh, you doing the OPO even twice a week and even once in a week. You can do fortnight. They're very, I mean, you can still get a good results. I mean, the frequency of OPO, there is enough literature on that. Uh, what is the standard procedure of embryo cryopreservation, which we told you the two methods of the slow, uh, slow freezing and then the vitrification, what frequently, how frequently you can subject a donor for OPU, both I, I have already answered this question. Uh, I think uh, uh, because uh, uh, tri-gas incubator is really indeed a uh, simple CO2 is, uh, is really needed or a simple CO2 incubator is sufficient. Uh, Yeda, would you like to answer this question? Tri-gas incubator is really needed or a simple CO2 incubator is sufficient? Oh, uh, the tri-gas incubator is started in the animal uh, maybe five years ago, okay? Before this, you use only the, the big incubator with uh, only the CO2. And some, some lab will use only this. But if you, if you want to, to start the lab, I suggest it to use the three gas incubator because in human, everybody now started with this. Then uh, it's better for the, principally for the cuter embryos. Thank you very much, Yeda. And uh, I mean, we have a lot of questions, but thanks a lot. We're looking at the time uh, limit. We're almost, almost three hours. And uh, now uh, the, to conclude, I request our uh, Animal Husbandry Commissioner to conclude it. I know he's traveling it, but still he's been continuously watching us uh, and watching the webinar, even though he's traveling. I'm really grateful to him, and I request him to do a, a concluding talk, and thereafter, uh, the last thing which I will be having, the vote of thanks, and then we uh, conclude the uh, webinar. Please. 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 Sir, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sham. Uh, a wonderful session. In fact, uh, after that meeting, I just rushed to this one and I came back into this meeting. It was really, really wonderful. I was driving throughout and uh, listening to all the speakers. I missed yours. So uh, it was really, really a wonderful session. In fact, uh, 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 people have spoken about not only the technique, but also the lab factors, the uh, animal factors, and the cement factors as well, which contribute a lot in uh, the success of 5 bf So I really appreciate the speakers. I thank everybody, uh, despite their old hours. They have contributed for so long. It's almost three hours now. So it's really a wonderful session, and I hope uh, the participants must have enjoyed and learn a lot from this particular uh, webinar on different details uh, which are basically have to be uh, taken into account uh, while performing IVF. So uh, I thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sham, and uh, would like to see that the technology is utilized uh, as we envisage. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Sir, now I request Mr. Pokrana, our uh, trustee, uh, to say a few words before I finally conclude it. So over to Mr. Pokrana, and he can say a few words, please. Uh, on behalf of JK Trust, I thank you, everyone, and especially the foreign dignitaries who could take out their time and participate. In fact, I am not from this line, 
but it was very enjoyable session and i think i can little bit discuss with dr sham when i'll sit with him next time uh, thanks a lot i enjoyed the session a lot thank you very much thank you now i uh, just to conclude it, sir we are very much thankful to dr pravin malik our uh, uh, animal husbandry commissioner government of india who has been always ready and uh, for uh, when, whenever i have made a request for sparing his valuable time and joining this webinar we are also extremely thankful to our international guest speakers dr charles luni and uh, dr yeda and uh, jane and julia for their excellent presentation and getting up so early in the morning so being saturday i i wish them a good nap now after this presentation and we are also thankful to all the participants from all over the india and abroad who have joined this webinar and last but not the least i must thank uh, my son in law uh, he should put his video on i think mr vishal somani who is an it expert in uh, organizing uh, these webinars to for me for the last 2 uh, to 3 months and i'm keeping him busy on every weekend the total proceedings as i told you video audio recordings of this webinar will be available on youtube tomorrow so those of your friends who have missed this wonderful opportunity can view the same we also appreciate receiving a mail from you to know your views about and the feedback about this webinar so that we can improve upon in a future webinar my email address is sham s h y a m dot zawar z a w a r at raymond r a y m o n d dot in so thank you very much and i declare this webinar as a close once again really thankful to each one of you from my heart for uh, sparing so much of time and uh, be with us thanks a lot i feel very very happy today thank you thank you thank you thank you dr sham thank you dr sham thank you dr jane and julia Bye. thank you very much thank you thank you dr have, have a nice have a nice day and i think all our three countries brazil united yeah. states and india they are going through the same pandemic situation due to covid so we pray almighty to get out of this as quickly as possible absolutely Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when you, whenever you are in Delhi, please do visit. There is a there is an invitation to all of you from our honourable animal husbandry commissioner to visit yeah. his office in Delhi. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you, sir. So Thank you. Most welcome always. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.